Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very exciting episode of an unexpected podcast. Today, finally, after such a long wait, we are here to review the Defense of the North supplement that just dropped. And my goodness, is this a piece of steak of a book? This is one meaty supplement that's adding a heck of a lot to the game. Um, now, we've already seen some of it through just uh, the various models being released and then the rules accordingly being released with them on Forge World and Games Workshop. But now we finally have the whole picture to talk about. So I'm joined by most of the crew here. I've got Matt in Boston, along with Evan, uh, Rainier in South Korea, and uh, Devin down the street from me. Hey, everyone. Welcome, guys. Hi, how's it going? De- Devin uh, in your basement. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Devin literally right over there. Going to knock on the wall, keep it down. Um, in any case, so this is such a big book that what we're going to do is we're going to try to kind of thematically bundle it. Um, there are five, maybe six different armies that get a decent amount of work in the supplement. And we're just going to kind of do them as one big bucket so we can finish off one force and then move to the next and have it be a little bit more coherent. And then for those who, who just want to hear about, you know, one army can stop listening after that, but let's be real. You want to hear about all of it because it's, it's so exciting. Um, And if you're into that kind of thing, the book also has a uh, wealth of narrative content. Uh, I think it was 22 scenarios is what's going on in here, three different campaigns. So if you are a narrative gamer, there's a lot of of great stuff in here for you as well. So with that, we're not going to do a list review today because it's going to be all we can do to get through the book itself in a a reasonable amount of time. So we're going to launch straight into it. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to kind of like bookend it with the two biggest ones, right? So first and foremost, let's talk about Dale, the Garrison of Dale Army List, which has five, um, four profiles and one Legion in this book. So a pretty substantial update to what was a very, very kind of boutique faction before. Now, um, luckily, a lot of the things that are in this book for Dale, we've already been able to review because they were released earlier. So just to quickly recap, um, three profiles we've already covered, um, King Brand, Prince Bard, and the Knights of Dale. So King Brand is the hero of legend for the faction. Um, and he's the one that when he's, when he's cornered, he can fight better bard is kind of the hero of valor for the faction and he's got the rule where if he's charged he gets plus one to wound and the knights of dale are the uh elite infantry for the faction and they are kind of like your you know fight for d6 and they also have that reverse lance is what i like to call it because when they get charged they are uh at plus one to wound uh very interesting profiles we went into them fairly in depth in other episodes so i don't want to spend too much time going over them um, so let's just go into the, the completely new one that came out with this book uh, that is a little bit of a surprise, and that is the Windlance. So the Garrison of Dale is getting um, the Windlance as a siege engine. Now, one interesting thing, and I think this is probably a typo, but as it's written right now, the Windlance is not available to the army as part of like the normal selection, right, where you have in this army, you can take X, Y, and Z. It's not listed. I believe that's probably a typo or an oversight because um, currently you can only take it in the Legendary Legion, but I'm, I'm going to guess that that's not going to stick. So the Windlance, it's a siege engine. It is 75 points, which is the same that it is in Gyrion or Bard's profile, so that's not much of a surprise. Uh, strength 10, defense 10, three wounds. That's pretty standard. Um, it is a small engine. It's crewed by two Warriors of Dale with armor and sword. One of these is automatically the Siege Veteran, and they all have the Mandale Infantry and Warrior keywords. Uh, it has the uh, Superior Construction upgrade built in, which I believe means it gets extra range, right? That yeah, it, it, it increases its range from going entirely across the board to going entirely across your board and the board next to your board. Excellent. Yeah. So you can, you can shoot other games at a tournament. That's what it is. Right. Perfect. Um, uh, for upgrades... Too. You can shoot into like the 40k too. <laughs> I don't, I don't well, know it why might actually anyone do ever picks there that too, up. Right? <laughs> no, well, nobody I mean, has ever picked that upgrade in the history of this game. Yeah, <laughs> you, no, you get I, it for I think free you're right. Because yeah. uh, dwarves built it, right? So right. like it's yeah. just like by default. It's factored um, into the 75 point cost already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, as for the options, very limited. It can take the um, engineer captain, which every engine can take, and then the additional crew for seven points. And its special rules are accurate, which means that rather than scattering six, it scatters three inches. 
Um, so I think this is a very interesting add to the army. Uh, I've been talking a lot, so I'll let somebody else give their thoughts first. Um, you know, whoever wants to take it, but. I'm, I'm actually a little sad that we led off with this one because I read, I read this profile and was like, huh, I'll never buy this. <laughs> um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it had, other than superior construction, it doesn't have any additional benefits. Am I right? No piercing shot, if that's what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, no piercing yeah, shot. Right. Um, they, in the, in no, the articles no promoting AOE. it, yeah, in the articles promoting it, they talked a hell of a lot about black arrows, but uh, thankfully no or maybe sadly, it arrow. doesn't have a bunch of rerolls built into it, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to. I, I looked at this and I was like, "Wow, this is massively overpriced for something that will kill one figure a turn." Correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't have the Hobbit book right next to me, but I'm fairly sure this is of similar price to the one that Bard can take. That's and we all know price. how useful that it's, is. It's so, exactly uh, the same price, and with Bard, with three or six points of might, doesn't ever take it. Well, or well, yeah. yeah. Right. I think there's one like gimmick I've seen, which I think Matt introduced. So, which is I mean, part like, of the reason oh, part yeah. of the reason why Bard doesn't take it as well is because you can't take it with a horse, so no one would ever give up the horse to take the wind lance. Well, you'd but also never think, take it. I don't you think don't this is it, gonna. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because like you don't want to um, be stuck to it. Right. Well, Bard can actually leave it, but in this particular case, I don't think uh, it's any better. Because if you look at something like a, a dwarf ballista, not the Iron Hills one, but the smaller one that's like 65 points, that's even that is a rare choice. And it's it's still accurate. Um, I believe it's still a strength nine hit. And it's got that pushback as well. It's not strength well, 10, is it? Yes, it's not strength 10. And that <laughs> really matters. It matters so much. Um, I can kill ball yeah, on fours. It, it doesn't have the pushback. So what's going to happen with this one is it's going to fail at scatter check because it only successfully hits its target on sixes. It's going to hit one model every turn. So it's going uh, to have it's a sixty-six percent uh, chance of killing it. Yeah, it's going to hit the the tiny little goblin that's standing next <laughs> to the enormous Balrog every time <laughs> yes <laughs> it's, you're, you're going to get into combat it's going to have killed four goblins and then you're going to fight for the rest of the game and it's going to do nothing yeah i i always thought that was amusing how you know you'd have this tiny little three foot tall goblin standing next to a balrog the size of a house and the siege engine will hit the goblin five out of six times mm -hmm. I'm not very familiar with weird. siege engines, but somebody can correct me on this. But does it even knock prone the guy it hits? It does, yeah. It auto it kills. Does. Okay. And auto kills them if it yeah. wounds. Okay. Yeah. So it's not obscenely awful as long as you hit that one in six scatter roll. Um, good luck with that. I, I think I would have been more interested in this thing if it hit on a three. I think yeah, I'm not even interested at in hitting on a three, but at least then the most accurate siege engine in the game. So it, so well, it's it's crewed that. by Warriors of Dale. So with the um, army bonus, and we'll get to it, the Legion bonus as well, it does actually hit on threes. So it is oh, actually okay. remarkably right. accurate, which is which is good. Yeah. So you only take it in the army bonus. But yeah, so I mean, you would never not take it with the army bonus because then it hits on fours and is extra crap. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this thing would be worth it. Perhaps if you got a black arrow mm -hmm. to shoot from. Hey, why not one? In the movies, they made it look like black arrows are in like mass production. Well, they were, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Like, I think what's going to happen is that they're going to have to rename the black arrow rule into something that has nothing to do with the arrow itself and more about the fact that, you know, Bard is particularly lucky, right? Or yeah. skilled for that matter. So, yeah. Rainier, any yeah. thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm kind of just looking at it like I'd rather take eight more guys, especially yeah, right. for the Dale list. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> I'd rather have like four, four or so more bows spread out the troop, and eight guys really pushes Dale over the edge because I'm seeing them as a faction close to the Corsairs. Mm -hmm. And having 42 models compared to 50, that makes a huge difference. I'd rather have the 50 over the Midlands. So that's always in perspective when looking at like things like this from a competitive standpoint what else could you take i think taking more guys is way better mm -hmm. yeah i think you got to put it into perspective 
I would rather take around eight more uh, men of Dale instead. Um, you always look at it with what you can take instead. And I think making the difference comparing this army kind of to closely with the Coursers of Umbar, uh, 42 models to 50 models in, in an army makes a huge difference. So for that reason, I'm not really that impressed with it too much outside of if you play a meta where there's a whole bunch of mos monsters and golovars running around, mm -hmm. which could come into effect. Yeah, so um, I'm actually a little bit more positive about this than um, all of you. I don't, you know, I don't think it's some kind of like amazing magical war machine that's going to suddenly terrorize the battlefield, but um, just having one on the table against the kinds of things that you're likely to see competitively it's going to force your opponent to have to come to you just on the threat that it could do something to their big model. And that's definitely something you want with the Dale army. And to your point, Rainier, I completely agree. But as you all know, I've been thinking about Dale a lot for like months now, basically since the Knights yeah. came out. And what I've actually found is that once you fill out all of the war bands for brand Bard and your captain, you're already at almost 50 models. And then you you have nowhere to go and you're at like 700 points so and those are making, all cheap heroes right yeah they're fairly cheap it's like uh 100 110 and 55 right with the captain he has thought about this for a while i have i've been writing a lot of lists <laughs> this is going to be like my nova army i want to take it to articon if i can make over there but um and so at that point you're already buying a captain anyway and you're getting like maybe two guys right so it's really the question of do you want the extra two might for the captain or do you want the war machine which theoretically could do nothing but theoretically could like one shot or dehorse a fell beast right which is not going to get any in the ways because it's too high up in the sky and i think the threat of it alone um might warrant its inclusion uh i think it needs to be tested obviously you might want the two extra might and the two extra marches that might very well end up being the case but i think that it's maybe in this army specifically uh as opposed to in a vacuum i think it might see a little bit more use than it might otherwise but, but yeah i mean it's, it's not it's not remarkable right um it's it's great it's accurate it hits on a three it's got that might off of the siege veteran for that one time you roll that five on the scatter and you really need to kill something and then when it does when it does kill the ghoul of or the fell beast or whatever it's paid for itself a hundred times over so so i don't know i'm definitely i picked one up i think it looks cool i think um i think i'm going to try it out it may end up being just as crap as we think but i i think it has some potential yeah, yeah and you I, might i, I kind of see it considered like in the perspective of like a dwarf ballista mm -hmm. not the iron hills ones but the durance folk one yeah you want to freak the opponent out to where they come towards you yeah and then you have the strength three bows that kind of like hit it yeah. and the throwing throwing axes and it closes in i think the wind lance too from that perspective you can take that focus of like yeah it's gonna elevate your shoot three elf bows you know what i mean well, it's going to give you a little bit more stuff. um kind of i don't want to say battlefield control but a little bit right where it's wherever it's parked it's going to play a role just by sitting there and having the latent threat of being a wind lance um and, and so again but that's only really at higher points right because once you once you yeah. hit about 700 you've maxed out on troops and then that last hundred points it's do i want the captain in a pair of guys or do i want this this wind lance in there um, and you want people to come to you because your your front line is the knights and they don't want to charge. They want to be charged to get their bonuses, right? So you're kind of giving them a damned if you do, damned if you don't choice. Like sit back and get shot by a war machine and elf bows or hit me and fight me with my, you know, fight four guys that are going to get plus one to wound when you do. So it's a very, it adds an interesting dynamic specifically to the Dale army, I think. And I'll give it to you for that one. Like in a specifically Dale army, if and you you know more about this than I do is a three up bonus on this thing that that is one reason I absolutely would take it is like okay oh, for the, the three you, up are you at three 50, up value? Uh, yeah, yeah. well Rob am I am I wrong on that you said that in the no no so it's I mean the the crew are warriors of Dale and warriors of Dale get the three up shoot value so it will hit on a three um in a garrison of Dale army or green alliance and mm -hmm. and in the legion which I'll cover in a second the so in that circumstance so it says four up but it's kind of disingenuous then it's not really it's not really well, it's, it's the same with the warrior of dale profile right where they hit on a four up but their army bonus makes it a three up so okay i don't know that i'd ever bring a siege veteran like we talked about might with this thing right no, the siege, oh, no, siege veterans siege veterans free 
Uh, you you wouldn't bring an engineer captain, is what you're saying. Sorry, right? yeah. engineer. Uh, no, I apologize. No. Engi- uh, upgrade a siege veteran to an engineer captain. Yeah, yeah. you, would, you <laughs> no, wouldn't. Bring no one the 50 would. Point no guy. one would ever. No one would ever. A siege. No, 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 no. Ever yeah. has. No one ever will. It shall not be done. I actually. Uh, I've, no. I've played so few siege weapons in this edition <laughs> that I forgot they all have a point of might just built in. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, you would never, even in this army, you would not pay for the engineer captain. You'd just buy a Dale captain that would go sit behind your lines, right? You would just never do it. But, um, and then like at a thousand points, you can probably get like two of these. And then that's, that gets a little bit fun. Um, It might be interesting if you're not playing it in the Legion, which we'll cover in a second again, but having like Gyrion and two wind lances and just have three of these on the field shooting people would be kind of a a fun little um, list to, to run every so often but so this is the most accurate siege weapon in the game right at three up shoot value i believe so i believe so uh, um, well I, I mean i guess i mean when bard shoots it it also has a three up shoot value sure and has six points of might yeah. to make sure that it hits and we I mean, still don't there's use very much there's also i don't know we don't have nick here to do the math but i suspect the 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 troll the trollopult and um the the siege ballista from the legendary legion that re-roll their misses mm-hmm. the assault on helm's deep one yeah, yeah are, they, are also they have a 75 percent chance to hit and this one has a 66 percent chance so yeah. Yeah. those are by technicality slightly more accurate but this certainly has the best shoot value of the all of the siege engines. Yeah. value right? right yeah and um one thing that so like the the bard wind lance part of the problem is that you want Bard in the thick of it, mixing it up, right? Like you don't want him deployed with a wind lance and like tied to it or leaving it. Whereas this, depending on your deployment setup, you, you know, you park it on a hill in the back of the field and it can just stay there and you're not worried about it. Right. So that's one of the benefits is that you're not, um, you're not having to kind of chain it to Bard and have Bard deploy uh, in a weird way because of it. So the accuracy too. The accuracy re- reliability, like mm-hmm. that's really good. You take Legolas just to do that for reliability, for accuracy, mm-hmm. to like make the opponent off guard. So mm-hmm. again, going back to what you said, like adding that to this list with all it has. Yeah, I, I changed my mind. Like I think, um, I think that as far as siege engines go, it's one of the one of the more decent ones. I think it's hard to compare because we do live in a world where assault on Helm's Deep exists, right? So it's hard to judge any siege weapon as as good unless it's, you know, two of them in that legion that are hyper accurate and always not, you know, never scattering. But I, I think that it, um, it has a place in the list. I, a few games will certainly determine one way or the other whether it's, it's um, better than taking a captain and a couple more bodies, but but yeah, I, I'm um I'm a little more positive on it. I, I I remain unconvinced. I actually think this is of the siege engines that people actually take. This is, I think, at the bottom of the list. I have um, to see this in the army. The, the one argument that I can say that Rob makes convincing is the fact that after you've taken everything else and you have fifty plus troops already gone, and I, and I haven't really mapped that out if that's how many you get in most games. But it's usually around like 47, 45. Which is a standard seven. Apparently, considering you're taking Knights of Dale at Defense 6 is pretty sizable, to be honest. Mm-hmm. In that circumstance, if you have nothing else to take and you're in a Legion, sure. Uh, so I, I can see, Matt, like if you're outside the Legion, yeah, I, I probably just have Well, I, so, so think about how you just structured that sentence. You started it with, or you, you inserted in the middle of it, if you have nothing else to take, which is what is telling me it's down at the bottom of the list, because there's a whole bunch of siege engines that are out there that are things that you take before you have nothing else to take. I mean, people, people build armies around the Urukai siege ballistas. There's a whole legion that's built around those people build armies around the iron hill ballista. Cause it does all sorts of stuff other than just kill well, one that's- figure. So that's like on the top tier of siege weapons. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> so but, <laughs> but but all of them are. I mean, the tr- yeah. the trollopult has <clears throat> has stuff built around it. Um, are they, people building armies around the troll catapult? Yeah, not not, not right. the mortal one. We're talking. No, about no, the- no. I'm I'm talking the mortal one. I, oh, got it. Oh, you're talking about. Oh, okay. No, no, all right. Yeah. It, so you're right. The 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 trollopult from the Azog's Legion thing may be below this thing. 
uh, just because it's so damn expensive. Um, but yeah, and, and there's also even the dwarf ballistas. I mean, that's that's not a if you know if I run out of dwarves, then I'll throw this thing on the board. It actually has a use because it has the whole piercing shot thing, and it's cheaper than this thing is. Um, I, I will say I'm shocked that this doesn't have the piercing shot, considering what I, it is. I think it's strictly because Bard doesn't. Yeah must be right and that's that's the only reason i could see it and honestly if you gave it to bard bard would be on that wind lance like daily and yeah. it just <laughs> think it'd be serious, he would he would literally that's all he would do he'd be like bye girls i don't yeah, know right. I'm about to machine he'd be like what's a horse <laughs> hey legolas shoot these little brats i'm on my wind lance yep. um, but so. that's what i can imagine i i would say this before we move on to the infinite number of profiles we have in this book um Anyone no, let's to talk about this for another hour. Yeah, right. We This is a competitive podcast. We are talking about it from a competitive standpoint. I think everyone on this podcast is a little bit, um, at least a little bit enthusiastic about the fact that the wind lance is a thing. It's Exists. a pro. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's I, I got to admit, from the, the movies, it, it pretty much emphasized that these things were all over the, the, the battlements of Dale. So yeah, this right. should exist. Right. I mean, look, for all my whining and complaining, I did buy one. So, you know, yeah. take it for what it's worth. Well, I will, I will just say this, Matt. Um, your your argument is correct. But at the same time, like, are you taking an Isengard Ballista outside of the Legion? Probably and not, And that's right? what I was about to say. Right? Like, so, like, within the context of where you take right. War Machines, this is one of those armies where there's a context by which it fits. Um, it's never going to be an assault on Helm's Deep, and nor should it ever be, right? But... But I think I think it's got a role. And I mean, here's the thing. I could be completely wrong. People will play games and they will either tell me that I'm a genius or that more likely I'm an idiot. And we will be like, out. yeah, I'm taking well, captains all day long. At, at, at least at <laughs> least it's not a Mordor siege bell. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, so um, we are going to move on from the Windlance and jump into the Dale Legion, which is the um, um, next exciting thing to talk about now. This legion, um, the Army of Dale, is essentially just the garrison of Dale minus Girion um, in terms of what you can take. So you, you can take Rand, Bard, Captains, Knights, Warriors, and a Windlance, literally the entire army list. The only restriction is that you have to take Brand, who has to be the leader, which, um, okay, great. You know, Good to be the king. Yeah, exactly. You're probably doing that anyway. Uh, and it only has two special rules, but within the context of this army, I think they're actually quite incredible. So the first is the skilled bowmen, which is that the captains and warriors um, improve their shoot value to three, which is the standard army bonus. For yeah, I was going to say, which I was going to say, which, which isn't a special rule because you would get that anyway. Yeah. So you get that for being Dale anyway. Um, right. So basically you're not losing it for taking the Legion, but the second one is amazing. It's called protect the King. Uh, friendly Dale models gain the sworn protector brand special rule. So suddenly your entire Fair army is bodyguard. Yeah. <laughs> so <is> insane. <laughs> um, as, as long as Brand is alive. As yeah, long as Brand is alive. Um, he's defense seven, right? He's defense seven. Uh, he has three wounds. Um, uh, he's look, he's not the toughest here in the game, but like you're protecting him anyway for a variety of reasons. But yeah. this took Dale from good to kind of nutty, right? Because suddenly you've got an army that's that's going to be, um, you're going to have an entire row of knights. They're D6, they get plus one to wound, they're fight four, and now they're fearless. You've got like 15 elf bows behind them that are hitting you on a three with their strength three bows. You've got like two striking heroes. You've got your obligatory march captain. And then you've either got a couple more dudes or you've got a siege engine that is accurate. Um, and then you can also fit in a banner and all of the things that you need. And it's not sexy. It's not one of those legions where you look at it and it does that one thing that is completely unique to the game. And it's like, oh my God, this is a, this is so cool. But pound for pound, it's one of the most well-rounded armies that you can take right now, right? Like it doesn't have cavalry, but the fact that you can get so many bows and you can put in a wind lance and then you want to be charged, so it's not a problem to be static in missions where you're allowed to be static. Um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty rocking, actually, to me. I think it's, I think it's really good. Yeah, and those like fight five fell beasts to jump in the back, or like any monster doing uh -huh. crazy things. You can be like, okay, here's six guys on you. 
yeah. have six dice. We'll see what happens. If not, like I'll kill you, you'll kill me, but we'll see. Like yeah. without even like blinking your eyes, you could do that. That's insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think there are gonna be a lot of games, like especially especially against like mass ring rates or something like that where the first thing you're going to do is like have a bunch of your guys dig a hole in the ground throw brand into it yeah. and then like <laughs> pile a whole bunch of dirt on top of him so that nobody can get to him brand uh, suddenly becomes a crewman for the wind lance <laughs> way in the back <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> yeah yeah oh. i mean just by just by existing your entire army being fearless and then you still have bard who's arguably the better fighter anyway uh, mixing it up in the front line um it's so good. <laughs> and it just as a reminder to anyone who doesn't have this, like Bard, uh, do we have his, uh, like, do you know, remember what his profile is specifically? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't want to go over him too um, extensively because we had already reviewed him on the podcast, but I've got him if uh, people want to hear. Um, so we don't, we don't have to go, I guess, into anybody. He's, Bard he, so here's, here's the summary. He's fight five, um, three attacks, um, and he has the... Uh, uh, I, I think he's got. Does he have two might or three might? Uh, are we talking about Bard? They're or both three. They're mm-hmm. both three. Yeah. Okay. They're both. Uh, both uh, yeah. They're both. Yeah. They're both three might. And then what he has is he has the he has the knight rule. So he has that um, spear that if somebody charges him, he gets um, plus one to wound. Yeah. Plus one to wound. And he's also got strike and defense, which are two great heroic actions. Um, right. D seven. Uh, Brand actually also has strike. He does not have defense. Uh, Brand also has a stand fast of 12 inches, which when you're sworn protectoring him is absolutely irrelevant, um, but still kind of cool. Uh, and they protect themselves, right? So everybody's going to be fearless in the in the Legion uh, so long as Brand stays alive. And uh, it's, who would have thought Dale of all armies would come out of this as like a competitive, cool, well-rounded army, right? And, and foaming at the mouth fanatics as well. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm assuming then, based on your review, you're not bringing a warhorn. I um, I think a warhorn is probably <laughs> one of those things you probably want two of in case one dies. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in case Brand dies, and then your war, and then a war. That's right. Yeah, you you actually want like six warhorns just to create a little TP around Brand, so that it's protected by metal brass horns. But yeah, so I don't. I mean, I, think I don't it's sort of. I think it calls to the uh, to how solid they've made the army already that they're not adding 50 special rules onto mm-hmm. this legendary legion just to make it playable. They're you know, just they've just thrown on one special fearless. rule and it's very, it's very strong, but I mean, mm-hmm. look at uh Theodred's guard, which correct mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong, also has the exact same special rule and yes. it's got a litany of other special rules just to make it playable. Mm-hmm. But with this, it's just this one special rule yeah. and the rest of it is completely relying on the, uh, fact that the army list is now pretty solid after all of these changes well, that have been made to it. Mm-hmm. When you combine the fact of solid range firepower and not only I get a bonus if I don't move, I mean, that's a very powerful combo. I imagine the way you kit this legion out is you do a front line of Knights of Dale and then a back line of Warriors of Dale with spear and shield just to kind of like maximize your points. I mean, Rob, you've kind of played or, this. No, that's or, not how you would do that. So I, shield. Uh, you, you do the ratio of two knights to one bowman with a spear every time. And the reason so is... You still have knights backing up knights. I would have knights backing up knights still. Okay. And the reason for that is if you took, let's say you take 30 knights in the army and you turned 15 of them into warriors of Dale with spears and shield instead, you're going to on net get like two, maybe three models out of it at the end. And for that, you're going to lose D6 on half your army. It's just not worth it. Yeah. And, you know, knights in your front rank, yeah, they're the ones that you want to be getting the charges because they're getting plus one to wound, but they're going to lose fights and die. And so the guy stepping up behind him is not going to be an inferior model. It's going to be another knight they have to deal with. So I would say that in this Legion anyway, specifically, I would go all knights for your fights and then... Um, I didn't mean to rhyme that, but now I'm going to coin it. Um, and then as and then a third of your army is bowmen. Uh, if you have the points, you probably should give them spears so that they can also plug into the line once you clash. Um, and yeah, and it's also at that point, like, if they charge you, great, you get the bonus, right? If they decline to charge you, 
equally great because then you kind of control the fights you want to have. And then yeah. the front guy just faints anyway. So you're either re-rolling once to wound or you're getting plus one to wound pretty much all the time. So for a mannish army that isn't strength four, it's actually remarkably killy and consistent, right? And because everyone is fight four everywhere, you're not, you're not worried about, you know, oh, is, am I going to be out of position with the guy who wants to be in this fight to support here or there? Um, but just doing the math, like, it's really, it's really not worth it to downgrade half of the knights. You're usually not even going to have the warband space anyway, so you're going to end up with extra points, which you're going to use to upgrade more guys to knights, right? Um, so in a, in a Dale army that's allied, I think there's maybe an argument for doing what you said, but in this legion, I would go all knights all the time. Well, you it's, it's really play. interesting because I feel like it's, even for new players, it's very forgiving you know what i mean because it's so balanced and not saying that you don't need skill you need a lot of skill to play this but like it reminds me a lot of when people first dabble into the game and play minister earth because of the high defense they have a lot of models they have cool heroes and you're not going to break super fast so i wonder too if you're going to see a lot of these played by new players oh this one for sure i I absolutely think well i mean barring any sort of you know, cost factor. I think this is an incredibly <laughs> simple, but it's a very there is a cost factor. Point. That's for sure. There is a <laughs> I mean, three models Denver, for I don't know how much, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's actually it's one of those armies that, especially if you are coming in new to the game, you this is. I know there was no Dale technically in the movies, but in the Hobbit films, like this is kind of the army you were brought up into. So mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. I can imagine a lot of people gravitating toward this though. It's pretty simple especially if you just do Knights of Dale. I know when I started playing, I actually really wanted to do Warriors of Dale all over the place. It's just, mm-hmm. that was all you had. So they were terrible. Warriors of Dale, when um, when they came out, the plastics, I just fell in love with the aesthetic of the army. So I just started mm. buying them, even though they were objectively not very good. Oh, I have like so I have a pile of them for of them. no reason. Well, and a lot of people were buying them to proxy Lake Town as well, right? Because they yeah, were like, these are a cheaper yeah. way to do Lake Town Guardsmen. But yeah. so I, I'm sitting on a pile of like 60 Warriors of Dale. And like, now I'm going to use a third of them because I'm playing all nights. But, um, but yeah, so it's a really cool army. It's, it's, it's beginner friendly in the sense that it's forgiving in some ways, but it's very rewarding for an experienced player because it has a lot of tricks that if you know how to maximize will make it punch way above its weight, I think. Um, I'm super excited about it. I was going to play this army well before there was going to be a legion that gave it fearless, and now I'm definitely playing this army. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but and I guess we'll see as we track through this. But I don't think there are any legions in this book that are cheap to collect. No, I don't think so. I, I think, think we're so at the point in the game where we're filling out outlier armies. Yeah. yeah so, so part oh, of the please. reason is most of these forces are <clears throat> new to the game for the first time ever, never existed, right? Yeah. And because they're coming at the time when Laurel, um, when the Middle Earth is basically being produced predominantly through the Forge World range, and therefore coming out in resin, they're going to be way pricier than yeah. the old all, plastics. All of these armies require Forge World stuff to make them work, and in some cases, and I think this is one of them, it requires Forge World stuff in quantity. Correct. I agree. And yeah. uh, some and might crazy. hear this and say, "Well, Easterlings are old," but the the fact that the pikemen were only in blocks of four. Yeah. Well, wait. Wait till you actually see the price tag on uh-huh. the Dragon Emperor, which we'll we'll talk about when we get there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and now that you have actual models for black dragons, and you know there will be places that require you to use them. Uh, I that strong. could get pricey. So, I think people are going to be proxying those. I, I really think that you're going to be coming come to tournaments and everyone's going to have black cloaks and everyone be like, that's my black dragon. Yeah. No, uh, we'll talk about that when it comes. I well, agree with yeah. you. I, we're we're going to probably end on Easterlings because I think that's the biggest like bomb going off in the meta. Um, but mm. we'll definitely get to that. So, so anyway, that is Dale. I am very excited mm-hmm. about this army. I think uh, all of the additions have been um very impactful and unless anybody else has any other thoughts i think we move on to erebor yeah yeah Yeah. go to that and like we said if you have any thoughts of the competitive nature of all the other models then we have multiple other reviews on them so yeah absolutely and um and uh, i'm predominantly going to try to talk about this from 
competitive first, obviously, because of the nature of the podcast. But mm-hmm. if you are a non-competitive player, there's also a lot of different fun stuff you could do with some of these armies. Like, why not make an army of six wind lances? Have fun, right? That's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, all right. So the next major protagonist in the book, and, um, and I went with Dale first because it's going to play into this a little bit. But that is Erebor Reclaimed, or, you know, the Kingdom of Erebor in the War of the Ring era. Uh, now, there are only two profiles out for this one, and we've already covered them both again in a previous episode. Um, they are Dane, uh, Ironfoot King Under the Mountain, so Old Dane, and Thorin the Third Stonehelm, so the, the guy who takes over for him when he dies. Um, Old Dane, for people who have been in this game for a while, is essentially identical to the original Dane profile that came out way back in the day before the Hobbit movies um, created Pig Dane. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about his rules as we talk about the Legion that he's in. And uh, Stonehelm, Thorin Stonehelm, is kind of like a pretty awesome uh, fighty dwarf hero, three might, uh, eight defense. And he has a cool rule where if you... Um, whenever he declares a heroic action, uh, it's free on a five plus, and he can change his heroic action after declaring it if an enemy has called one. So if you know you call a strike and they don't call a strike, you can switch it to a combat uh, if you want or something like that, which is which is actually very useful. Um, so there are there are no new profiles for Erebor beyond that, but there is two kind of big changes. The first, and this is kind of important to make the army playable, is that they amended the army bonus for Erebor Reclaimed. So now Dane counts as Thorin for the purpose of Dubikar. So basically he becomes a six inch banner in his army, which is great because now it is not a completely worthless army bonus if you're taking Erebor Reclaimed without Thorin. Plus and you can never afford the banner if you're taking Erebor. Yeah, so that's exactly right and- as well. To be fair, even with Thorin, the uh, the Erebor reclaimed army bonus is utter garbage because in uh, that version, the Iron Hills warriors are an Erebor warrior, so they Correct. don't benefit from the banner. Yeah. Now, in this version, they all get the Erebor keyword specifically. It's part of Dane's like changing the army rule, basically. So if you take Dane, they all become Erebor, and so they all count him as a banner within six inches. So it's actually useful. And it goes a long way towards um, when, when Dane, you know, was first shown for his rules. I think a lot of people were thinking that's cool, but, you know, he's kind of underwhelming for his cost compared to his younger self, essentially, and other options you can take. So this goes a long way toward making him um, a much more valuable piece if he's going to be a six inch banner for your whole army. So so that's cool. I think that's that's a nice little bit of cleanup that um, I think probably a lot of people expected to happen but it's nice to have that actually happen Mm. um so let's just go straight into the uh erebor legion which is actually a combo legion it's the um what is it called here it's called the defenders of erebor legion and it's a combo legion with um the iron hills erebor reclaimed dwarves and the warriors of dale it's very interesting so you can take um all of the dwarves that you could take in a third age War of the Ring era Erebor. So obviously Dane and Thorim, as we mentioned, but Dwalin, Biffer, Bofer, Nori, Dori, and Gloin. Um, Iron Hills captains with all of their usual options. Then you've got the option of Brand and Bard, who we just discussed in the Dale section, which is why I started with Dale. Um, captains of Dale with all of their usual options. And then Iron Hills Dwarves, Iron Hills Goat Riders, Warriors of Dale, and Knights of Dale. Now, in this army, um, you, you have to take a, uh, a named dwarf hero, and you have to take a named Dale hero as part of like the what you need to do for the Legion. It doesn't actually say which one, so you can pick. And it's got the usual keyword lock for leading troops. So only Erebor with Erebor and Dale with Dale. So you can't mix like Warriors of Dale and Iron Hills Dwarves within the same warband generally. Um, for the special rules, it's actually kind of interesting. So the first one's called Long Standing Alliance. Dale models within one inches of friendly Erebor models reroll once to wound during the fight phase. Additionally, Erebor models within one inch of a friendly Dale model reroll once to wound during the fight phase. So essentially, if Erebor and Dale models are near each other, they get reroll once to wound in combat, which is so you know, 
so what you want to do, I think, is have a line of uh, probably Knights of Dale um, backed up by a line of warriors of Erebor with spears, and then everybody gets the plus one. And if they charge the line, then the word, or I'm sorry, the Knights of Dale get plus two. Because I think basically if, if you have a spear support that's the other type of guy, and then just both a technicality guys here, it's it's uh re-roll ones, not plus one. Oh, re -roll which, ones. Is okay. big, okay. which is a big difference. Yes, that is an um, enormous difference. Okay. <laughs> and and also um I think it might be interesting as well, uh, the fact that you can change uh who's in front based on your opponent so for example if you've got if you're facing strength four guys you can put your dwarves in front and keep your uh, knights of dale behind and if you're facing high defense armies that are tough to crack you can put your knights up front and your uh dwarves behind and i think that'll create an interesting dynamic mm -hmm. for the army yeah um uh i agree and I have thoughts on that as well. Um, but first, let me just go through the couple of these special rules here. So they have two more special rules that are essentially identical. They just change who does them. One is called a bond forged in war, and the other one is called the heiress to the kingdoms. And essentially, the first one is for Dane and Brand, and the other one is for Thorin and Bard. But they both do the same thing, which is that if one model would be tr one of the pair would be trapped at the start of the fight phase, then the other one can have uh, declare a free heroic combat. But if successful, they have to go uh, towards their um, trapped allies fight if possible, and if not possible, move as close as possible. It's it's a it's the standard thing that you see in a couple of different places where you have hero pairs um, like uh, Dare Wine, for example, doing it with Theoden. But it's the whole I'm going to get a free heroic combat if my ally would be trapped, which is interesting. And then the last rule is royal bloodlines. Before we do that, can we just mm -hmm. talk through this rule to make sure that I, so I want to make sure I understand sure. the concept of trapped at the beginning of the fight phase. So I think, as I understand it, that would not be triggered if, say, a model is charged by cavalry, because at the beginning of the fight phase, he's not trapped. He's only going to be trapped if he loses and gets knocked over. Yes, I agree. All right. But you I, could... I read it as if they would be unable to essentially back up for whatever reason should okay. they lose the fight. That's how I right. read it. So that does not mean if you've got like a single rank of steer, spear support that you're trapped because you at least, even though you could say, ah, I'm just not going to back up and trap the guy, at the beginning of the fight phase, you're not necessarily trapped. Correct. This right. is such a confusing thing. Well, and um, another but, place yeah. that it would apply is if you were prone, you're automatically trapped if you lose if the you're fight. prone, right? But if you're prone, it auto triggers. And you can also make yourself trapped during the course. If somebody charges you, if you bring like an extra rank of guys in behind so that you can no longer back up, you can basically trigger this her heroic combat ability if you want to do it. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then, so the, the last rule is very simple. Friendly models within three inches of Dane, Thorin, Brand, or Bard count as being in range of a banner. So basically, every single one of your main named heroes is a three-inch banner for all their troops. So um, those are the Legion rules. I think this is actually a pretty interesting Legion that you could build a couple different ways. Um, you had already talked about kind of the, um, the two-step with knights and dwarves. I think... I think just doing a line of Iron Hills dwarves uh, in kind of like a like a like a half cube, and then filling in the center with Dale Bowman with spears, um, so that you get the Iron Hills front rank, which is a superior, and then you still get the rerolls for everyone, and you still get three up shooting throughout your army or elf bow shooting is another way you could go with that one. Though I really like the idea of just making it all combat all the time and just like loading up on on combat profiles, but. But yeah, interesting little little army that I will I will definitely need to think about more to wrap my head around. Yeah, yeah that is interesting. Probably, I'm just I mean I'm just I'm just waiting for the easterly part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I kind of wonder. Yeah, but I, I, I think the I think the banners are interesting as well. Sorry to cut you off there, Devin. Uh, oh, no. I'll make this quick. But uh, it's it's interesting how it's not like with other legions and armies one hero gives a massive banner effect like for example Imrahil gives a 12 inch banner effect mm -hmm. um but with this it's sort of like an incremental thing like if you take 
two heroes, you get two three inch banner effects. If you take three, you get three. Mm -hmm. So writing lists for this will definitely be interesting because um, correct me if I'm wrong. Dane does not have March in this iteration. Uh, so we'll check. Uh, he does not. Yeah. So none of your main heroes have March. So you're going to want to fit in a captain. Um, and then the question is, how many of those banner heroes do you try and fit in? Um, and I think the remainder of the, the dwarven heroes may be very challenging to get into this army, except at high points. Um, so it may have a lack of variety, but we'll see. Yeah, I think um, you're, once you take one named pair, whether it's Brand and Thorin, which I actually think might end up being more common just on points, or Dane and um, Brand, and then you put in the captain that you kind of need. And I'm guessing you're probably going with a with an Iron Hills goat captain just to have an extra like combat piece. I don't think you're getting many, many more after that, if if any ever, right? Now I, I've played around with versions of this list and it's you know it, it because the models are so expensive and the heroes aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's I mean it's it's hard to get all four of the name of the main name characters let alone try and stick like Dwalin in there or, right. or yeah. somebody else. I think you're actually just doing one of those two combos with the special rule attached and then maybe one of those like mm -hmm. the champion dwarfs. Yeah, and that's probably it. If you're if you were going to play this as like a weird all hero army though, all of them would get banners near your guys, right? So you could do like a crazy all hero build with it probably. Yeah. You probably want, I mean, you also probably want Dane and Dubakar too. Um, but I don't think you get that because that would be, um, this would be a Legion. So it wouldn't have the army bonus. Oh, okay. That's the army bonus. Yeah. Right, it's it's it. not tied to Dane's profile. It's the army bonus for the army for Aragorn okay, claims. Right. So you, you wouldn't get it in the Legion. You wouldn't get it in the Legion. And all you right, also well, wouldn't right, get the enough. three up shoot for, for the Dale archers, for the Dale which makes archers. them infinitely yep. oh, less valuable. Wow. That totally changed my opinion of this. Actually, I didn't even think about that, but. So I was kind of um, thinking, like, why would I play this Legion over a Thranduil's Halls, Erebor, or well, that, that is actually interesting, and I think we can very quickly uh, weigh the alliance options compared to the uh, this Legion. And I think the big thing with this Legion compared to just allying Dale in Erebor is the fact that your bow limit stays... Um, throughout the entirety mm -hmm. of the army. I yeah, think that's the selling factor mm -hmm. um, because yeah. Dane provides that banner anyways with the army bonus for the mm -hmm. dwarves and your shoot value increases uh, for the Dale models. So I think it's just the number of bows in this legion mm -hmm. is better. So I think if you're running this legion and not running max bows, I think you may be making a mistake with that. You said your shoot value increases. What states that? It doesn't increase in the Legion. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, if it doesn't increase, and I'm like, if I were to play a normal army of Iron Hills, I'm kind of wondering if I'd rather be afraid of six crossbows or in a, an Iron Hills ballista versus like a handful of these shooters from Dale. Like it just... Yeah. You So you could actually, well, in some circumstances, what you may want to do is have front rank of knights of dale and then second rank of crossbows with speed with spears of, of iron hills crossbows yeah, yeah. That, i think that's with interesting spears. yeah 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 spears. i I, I, I almost feel like that'd be a better way to play it's like almost like you're trying to play dale mm -hmm. with iron hills support which but you wouldn't get a lot you get their cavalry and you get their their guns crossbows but and yeah. you'd get access to some of the um the the dwarf heroes which hit a little bit harder than the dale heroes but <clears throat> my mind is now whirling with the possibilities of like how to use this heroic combat rule like ideally what you'd want to do is you'd want to have like <coughs> bard and thorin like fighting next to each other mm -hmm. so that you know the the combat of the combat of one of them effectively traps the other Right. Right. So you wall one guy off and then you put Thorin into, con you know, you, you wore, you know, you, you send in um, Bard and then you, you know, you kind of wall off around him 
on one side and then on the other side you put Thorin and Thorin then gets the heroic combat. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then, you know, he can go and, you know, he can then do his heroic combat and either back out of there, thus freeing Bard or, you know, kill somebody and move, thus freeing Bard. Mm-hmm. Um, so you create the you create the trap and then you solve it with the heroic combat that the trap creates. Yeah. So one thing, um, one kind of like synergy that gets even better in this legion. What I what I like to do with with Dale a lot with Brand. So his his special rule is if he would be trapped, um, at the then he can reroll one dice to the dual roll and one dice for the wound roll. Right. So it's actually mm-hmm. it's actually makes him a much better fighter. So with him. What I like to do is you put him in the front rank, you have a normal spear behind him, and then you float a banner behind him. And if it's a fight that he's likely to be okay in, you deliberately trap him with the banner so that he's re-rolling two dice to win the fight and gets five attacks and then re-rolling to wound if he's not going to be threatened if he loses the fight. So if you do that in this Legion, you then also get a free hero combat off of Dane. So you're getting a lot more action economy, right? Where you're like selectively juicing up a brand in order to also get hero combats off of Dane. Um, and everybody's getting, you know, banners everywhere. So, so you're actually got a, you've got a pretty good chance to roll those sixes that you need. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one trick in this Legion that gets a little bit better. It works great in Dale, right? Um, it's, and here you just get a little more for it. Now, my question though, is would you guys, cause I'm com- trying to, again, compare this to the battle of the five armies. I feel like the battle of the five armies brings a little more than this does. Am I, am I off? You no, mean actually, uh, just allying just that? You, just you mean just ally. allying Iron Hills with uh, elves and stuff? Yeah, I yeah, think probably. I, I can't all, see yeah. Thranduil's halls for and, and Iron Hills being not played over this. Like I'm yeah, just like kind of like, eh. just from a competitive standpoint. And oh, like, so this almost seems like you're trying to hoard out a little bit more. And that's, so, so this um, does well, give you. I think this does give you kind of a. This may give you a bigger army. It will um, certainly it does give you a bigger army over the and, grand scale of it. Like it, yeah, and I mean you get things like free banners, um, mm-hmm. you know, which are gonna, you know, get you even, you know, an even bigger army. Well, and your whole army um, should be rerolling once to wound as well, right? If you're positioning, well. if you're playing it right. Yeah, I just yeah. feel like okay, reroll once to wound because the Knights of Dale. You're gonna be playing Knights of Dale, which are arguably the same price of elves. So it's kind of shaky on whether or not. So realistically, the reason you're getting a bigger army is because you're not playing Thranduil. You're getting cheaper heroes in general. Yeah, exactly. And well, so you're also, you got to pay 25 points for that banner in the, uh, in the, the Erebor Elf Alliance. Um, Which and, actually counts as a banner for several missions. Well, it does count as a banner for several missions, but in this one, you're going to get <laughs> probably, you're going to get at least two of them and, you know, potentially four of them. Um, so I don't know. I, I would have to do the math. I would have to sit down and do the math. Yeah. 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 I, I think that, I think it's interesting. Um, and it's an interesting thought exercise that I need more time to kind of work out honestly. Right. Like I think there's potential, but I'm not willing to kind of call it one way or the other. I look at Dale and I'm like, this is great. I know exactly what to do with this. And I'm happy to play this, this I look at and I'm like, this is cool. I see a lot of potential neat tricks in here. I just haven't put together the puzzle yet. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any any other thoughts on Erebor before we move on? This requires playtesting. I mean, I otherwise yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. I, th- I think I think too. I think this requires like multiple tournaments to see what you can fully get out of it, and you'll yeah. probably learn more as you go. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So we are going to move on to the uh, the next list here, which is incredibly exciting if only because it has never existed before in the game outside of i think it was like a throwaway line in one of the legions of middle earth books or something of course we are talking about the bay ornings a brand new faction in the game um the models were recently previewed so it it to clarify for new users it's not actually a faction it's a legion but for all in turn yeah. So it's it's it not a faction? a faction, but you can t- you can play it outside of the legion. It is possible to play it outside of the legion. So can it ally? A, it can. 
So why don't I go through it and then we'll talk about it. So no, basically, why don't we just ask you questions? And I would rather bombard Rob with my we, uh, <laughs> I, I hear I hear the peanut gallery, but I block them out. Mute. <laughs> um, so we got two new profiles and one legion. Uh, so again, a pretty like small amount of additions that are going to make a outsized impact on the game, though. So. Um, we obviously are going to start with the big guy. We're going to start with um, Grim Beorn, uh, the the son of Beorn, and he is. Um, we're going to go. This is the first profile we kind of have to actually cover because it's it's really new. Uh, Grim Beorn is a man Beorning infantry hero of valor. He costs two hundred points in his man form. He's a movement six, fight five, shoot four, strength five, d five, three attack, three wound, six courage hero with three might, three will, three fate. Comes stock with a hand and a half axe and a great bow. Has heroic strikes, strength, and defense. Is burly, fearless, resistant to magic, and has woodland creature. Um, and then he also has the skin changer rule, which is essentially the same thing as Bayorn, where you roll a d6 on a four plus, you can transform into a freaking bear, which is the coolest thing ever. And he also has Leader of the Bayornings, where only bear and bayorning models may benefit from his heroic actions or stand fast. <clears throat> um, as part of his profile, uh, you can take, if you take Grim Bayorn in your army, um, Grim Bayorn and his Bayornings are um, green allies with Halls of Thranduil, and then they're yellow allies with the rest of the world, basically, right? So anybody who's relevant, so not like Numenor and all of the ancient armies, but all of the all of the armies that would have existed at the time are yellow allies with with them. Should you take? So are they are are they not yellow allies with Hobbit armies? Um, I I'm not they're, sure. The Shire, yeah, it's a, yeah. it says so that the Shire is in, in there. Hobbit era armies. Is Hobbit my era question. armies? Um, yes. Yeah. I think so. Oh, Hobbit era. Like, oh. Yes. Yeah. Like army of Lake Town and those yeah. types of armies. Well, Erebor reclaimed. Yeah, Erebor reclaimed. Dale, right? So. No, so no, no, no. Then to answer your question most specifically, no. So, so this yeah. army is specifically um, designed for the lord of the rings part of the third age and his yeah. convenient yeah. allies I'll, exactly. I'll read them all for so you no, so no very devious yeah. people allying them in with army of lake town or anything like that no it's uh it's dead of dunharrow erebor reclaimed so long as it has uh dane or thor in the third fangorn fellowship fiefdoms garrison of dale as long as it includes brander bard la florian Minas Tirith, misty mountains rangers rivendell rohan the shire and wild men of Druidon. And then obviously Halls of Thranduil is um, is the only green ally. So they can have they can have um, a bear in the green alliance. Everybody else gets yellow. Um, and yeah, and so he obviously also transforms into a bear. Uh, the bear works just like Bayorn, where the stats change, uh, but the wounds and any like might will and fate you've spent carry over as normal. Uh, keeps his heroic actions, strikes strength defense, um, uh, remains burly, fearless, resistant to magic, terror, woodland creature. But not um, berserk, right? But he does not have berserk. Not berserk. Yeah. He does have the uh, brutal power attack where he bear hugs you to death. So um, instead of striking, you immediately do a strength 10 hit. If it's successful, you do it again, and you do it again until they're dead or you fail, which yeah. is one of the coolest special strikes ever where you just give you just give a really loving hug to someone until they die. Um, or until you roll a one or a two, which is usually pretty yeah. soon. So yeah, um, so and he in bear form is pretty much the same stats as Baron, except he's only fight seven instead of eight, uh, strength eight, d8, three attacks, three wounds. So you know, a bear, but not a berserk bear. He's more of but a not a berserk he's, bear. He's more of a contemplative bear. That's right. He he likes to think a little bit more about the people he is eating for snacks. Yes, so. he is. He is a bear of slightly more brain. <laughs> this is um this is great you now have like you know hey boo boo the two bears running around together <laughs> <laughs> so um, rob is there any like disadvantage or differences between grim bayorn's bear and bayorn's bear other than the, the uh rep? so no no berserk um yeah. he's one less fight i have to actually look at bayorn's bear to make a direct comparison uh, there's there's no other differences it's just bayorn's bear is fight eight 
uh, Grim Bayorn is fight seven and Grim Bayorn isn't berserk. And another yeah. mild change um, in the man form is Grim Bayorn has a great bow. Bayorn does not have a ranged weapon. Yep. So that's pretty cool. Um, a, a bear is a bear. Anybody who knows Bayorn knows Grim Bayorn more or less. Oh, sorry. My dog just ran into the room. So he's going to sit down next to me and be quiet, right? There you go, buddy. My dog named Gandalf, by the way. That's how big of a Lord of the Rings nerd I am. <laughs> Um, and coming along with Bayorn are the Bayornings. Um, you, you know, you liked half trolls. Now you can have half bears. So they're 24, <laughs> 20 point infantry models. They have a meaty stat line, um, fight five, uh, shoot four, strength four, defense four, two attacks, two wounds, courage five. They come stock with a hand and a half axe and a dagger and can swap their hand and a half axe for a great bow for free. Uh, they are burly and they are woodland creature and they have the followers of the bear rule, which means that while within six inches of a friendly bear model, they count as being in range of a banner. So yeah, essentially they are, they're like slightly less durable, but slightly killier good guy half trolls. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and read the Legion because, I mean, the Army and the Legion are pretty much going to be synonymous, even though you theoretically can't play them. So the Legion is both bears, Bayorn and Grim Bayorn, and Bayornings, not much more to it. Uh, if it includes both bears, then Bayorn will default to the General instead of Grim Bayorn um, because they're both heroes of valor. And friendly models may benefit from Bayorn's uh, heroic actions and his standfast because he also has that rule where nobody can benefit really from can. his stuff. Yeah. Um, and then the special rules are quite phenomenal if you like bears. So great resilience. Whenever and who doesn't a, like bears? And who doesn't like bears? Hey, boo-boo. Uh, whenever a friendly bear model suffers a wound, roll a d6, and on a five plus, the wound is ignored as if a point of fate was being uh, spent. So the bears have a five plus shrug. Charge of the bear. Whilst they have the bear keyword, bearn and grim bearn gain the monstrous charge special rule. That is about time. Natural resistance, the entire army gets resistant to magic. And fueled by fury, this is another huge one. Bayorn and Grin Bayorn do not need to roll for their skin changer special rule. They can transform at will. So this you is, have, the Legion is the only way to play this army. Let's be honest. Well, unless, yeah, you, like that's, unless you want a big bear to run around with Thranduil on an elk or something. Which, like, But yeah. everyone has known that the bear, yeah. the, Bayorn is one of the most underplayed monsters and not not by uh, honestly, I don't I don't think he should be played. Like two hundred points for not having monstrous charge. That monstrous charge keyword it changes put, everything. Yeah, it put Gulivar on the map. Like one ability change, but all right, get a yes fly. But whatever. It, it honestly, this legion is like the only way to play them, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. But, I, I don't know. I think that I think the B earnings may be sufficiently good. Yeah, okay, yeah. not the was, bay warnings. I mean the bears. Yeah, we, we well, well, you need a bear to this. take a bay warning. Okay. Yeah. I don't know yeah. that a 200 point tax to bring in half trolls is worth it. Yeah, but these I guys mean, are these, these guys are more than yeah, half trolls. They're, they're more than half trolls. Like I was talking, we were talking about this earlier. These guys are like insane. Insane. Um, looking at their profiles. I mean, they've got fight five, mm -hmm. strength four uh defense for two attacks two wounds which is completely unheard of in a good warrior profile and unlike half trolls which have an absolutely garbage courage and therefore can't be conveniently allied with anything because they immediately start to suck these guys are courage five mm -hmm. so they don't have a courage problem yeah they're they're and not only that they've got axes and they can go two-handed for free because they've got burly which means you can strike at an effective strength of seven, which means <laughs> so good. they're going to yeah. be ludicrously strong. So I think there is merit at higher points, even if Grim Bayorn isn't the most powerful hero on paper. If you ally uh, Grim Bayorn and maybe like 12 of these guys with maybe something like a Galadriel with blinding light to protect these guys from shooting. You're going to try to get and then Galadriel? Just like, Oh, you mean at higher Lothlorian. points? Yeah, yeah, Lothlorian, Lothlorian Galadriel. Galadriel. Okay. Yeah, yeah, with with Galadrim court spearmen. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. Well, with or the, or the even pike guys mm, with the fight six. Even just min, just put Minas Tirith spearmen behind them, and you're 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 probably doing just fine. I mean, because Grimbiorn's 
Grim Bjorn with these guys allied, allied in doesn't have, I mean, he doesn't have the monstrous charge, but he also doesn't have a lot of the other things that kind of made Bjorn a bad idea. He doesn't have Berserk. He's not going to be going off into space. Mm-hmm. His heroic actions can actually affect the other Bjornings. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, his fight, his fight seven mm-hmm. is good not enough. Not an alliance. Can it? Can he in an alliance? Yeah, I think he's got. Isn't isn't oh, there? Oh, it does say Bjorning models. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, so so. Bayorn can't outside of the Legion. Grim Bayorn can as part yeah. of his profile. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So you know, and and I mean, let's face it. He's still, you know, fight seven and you know strength eight, and um, you know has all the other bear stuff that goes with him. So. You know, when you call it a 200 point tax, I think you may be underselling it a little bit. Yeah. It, he's not exactly a 200 point paperweight, but I, I just feel like when you can tie up a big base model like that, you, I mean, the fact that, yes, he has monstrous brutal power attacks and such. So I'll give him that. But the, I just, the, the Bjornings, the Bjornings are significantly undercosted. And, and I think it's because you're required to bring a 200 point model. Bring yeah, it. no, I mean, I, I, I think, yeah. I think that's right, but I think it, yeah. it balances out in the end. Yeah, I think if the Bayornings had a rule where you could like take them without a leader at a certain warband size, ah. that would be way, way underpriced, <laughs> way underpriced, right? Yeah, yeah way, way underpriced. Yeah, and yeah, so for sure, absolutely. And I, here's the thing: I'm absolutely tempted to bring these guys. I mean, you, Evan's analysis is right. I mean, the effective strength seven, they will be gunned down. Um, obviously everybody's shooting a bit two wounds. I mean, uh, we'll give it to some durability there. Um, so here's so, a curious question about them though. Uh, great bows. How many of those are you sacrificing plus one to wound for? Oh, that's I'm tough to sure. say. And it's possibly yeah. none, honestly. Yeah. It, right. may possibly <laughs> be. it depends. It, it depends. So it depends if you're allying them or not. I think in the Legion, you take the bows. Um, mm-hmm. I think what, cause you're going to have plenty of other guys around who are not going to have the bows. I think outside the Legion, you may you, you may just be taking none of these because you you rely on you know your other so guys to, mm-hmm. to do the bows. Um, but you know this may be one of those situations where you have like your your group of um, Minas Tirith guys with uh, shield and spear who like march up in the front rank, and then these guys you know, basically. You know, on the turn that they go in, these guys charge through the uh, spearmen and the spearmen come in behind. So you got your mm-hmm. defense seven guys in front to take the shots until you close. And then these guys kind of charge through the mm-hmm. through gaps and uh, into the enemy army. Yeah, I um. So obviously I'm over the moon about Dale, but I am absolutely obsessed with this army, too. This is such a cool way to do Bayornings. It's such a unique army. Um, they've got utility for allies, but you're right, Devin, you're probably playing the Legion more often than not. And I know a lot of people are saying that, oh, well, you know, shooting meta, this, that, and the other. And it's not it's not wrong. They're only D4, but even in like a really worst case scenario where you're running into like 18 Corsair crossbows, um, on average, they're killing two of them a turn. If you're getting one or two turns of shooting and you've got two angry bears that are still running at you and these guys are going to close into combat they're going to shred you when they get there even if they've lost you know four or five guys and in the legion at 800 points you're getting both bears and 20 of them so i think that their durability is a lot um a lot higher with that two wounds than um and the fact that they have woodland creatures so they can like hug through trees and stuff on their way in um it's they're a lot more durable than they appear on paper and then anything they touch is just going to be a red mist within no time, especially when you've got two hungry, monstrous charging bears coming in and throwing stuff around and bear hugging and disrupting the line. And, oh, this is going to be so much fun. I am so excited. Yeah. But and again, again uh, very pricey army because it's all Forge World. It's all Forge World. And uh, by the way, I, I think Evan's idea of like putting them in an army with Galadriel is another Hundred uh, percent way to go. Completely uh, yeah. agree. I with mean, you. she can take eighteen guys, so you don't have a huge hero tax. Ta- mm-hmm. So I was, I was looking at an army. I think it was a thousand points because at eight hundred, I looked into it, and it's challenging to get. You get like mid thirties model count, which isn't the best. Um, <laughs> but two wounds but, goes a long way. Yeah, I mean, but at like a thousand points, like you can take Galadriel, 
you can take a war band of uh, Grim Bayorn and like 12 of them. Uh, if it, you can fill up Galadriel's war band with the Galadrim court ga guards, get the fight six in there. Um, and then you just take a couple of war bands of Minas Tirith and spam out on guys. And you've got like low 40s, mid 40s mm -hmm. model count mm -hmm. with a front line of them. And I, th I think that could have some merit. I'm eager to experiment with some Shire armies. Gonna, yeah, why not? I'm going to throw them in some, with some hobbits and block bow fire with uh, <laughs> with bodies. <laughs> <laughs> just glue <laughs> glue hobbits to the bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I just had this image of like the Bionings, like each picking up a hobbit and like holding it in front of them <laughs> for the enemy. <laughs> I mean, why not two ho hobbits, one in each hand, just like <laughs> them one to each arm. Yeah, that's right. It's like the perfect match for them, right? Because either they hold them up to take the arrow, or they snack on one because they're bite-sized for yeah. them, right? There you go. Or they okay. just raid their honey in like food stores, so it's perfect. You know, I honestly wish it would work. The lack of heroic march means the army probably wouldn't work, but still, mm -hmm. I'm like, it's a, it's gonna be a fun experiment. Yeah, the lack of march is probably the biggest weakness you have for pure bearnings, but I <laughs> I still think they're going to be um, a lot better than people are giving them credit. I think they're durable. I think they're, they punch hard. Um, and I think they're just going to be incredibly fun with those two bears running around. So, yeah, yeah. Fun yeah. factor is definitely an all time hot. And, and, you know, just cool factor of this has never existed in the game before. So, 100%. you know, kudos for bringing in something completely new we've never seen and um, and making it exciting. I will say for this entire book, biggest shock of the book right here. So for uh, me. Yeah, for sure. The like Bay the, Warnings, the I, that out. wasn't hinted at, wasn't like suggested at all. And you would have thought that would have been a big thing. There would have been like, by the way, we might get bears. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, that's I actually... It's, um, I think it's one of the best looking <clears throat> models too that yeah are, are being released especially the bay orange um, like there's some easterling players who might disagree but i don't know yeah. <laughs> it, it depends how much you're into heavy metal yeah mm -hmm. norwegian heavy metal yeah that's right yeah well um devin i think you you said it best when you said biggest shock of the book it's an excellent segue for what i feel obligated to cover so next. before we before we go into this um do we just want to get rid of the uh, the the easy stuff first uh, before we get into the big thing? Or oh, so I've, we've still got Lothorian and Mortar to go through before we hit Easterlings, if that's what you mean. Oh, I, I don't think Rob was talking about the Paladin. Mm, the yeah, other yeah, yeah. shock. I was. Well, I was. We, we, I was we can edit. Say, the, we can edit this part out, shock. Devin. <laughs> No, I, I'd say that the biggest shock of the book, beyond the fact that Beornings showed up, is the fact that Lothlorien basically didn't show up in their own book. <laughs> so Lothlorien yeah. gets one profile, no legion in the defense of the North, which a third of the book is devoted to Lothlorien either fighting orcs or taking down Dol Guldur. Um, and the profile that they got... Um, let's just say that it leaves a lot to be desired but you know let's cover it they so didn't even our get next a legion did they you said they didn't get a legion right? no legion one profile no legion no soup for you yeah. lothlorian um now the profile they did get is orifin which is the third brother of the haldir rumil orifin trio um orifin and rumil are getting beautiful new models so i mean at least they're getting some love in that sense but uh, their one profile is an 85-point hero named Orifin. He's Elf Lorian Infantry Hero of Fortitude. Um, fight 6, shoot 3, pretty standard. Um, strength 4, defense 6, 3 attacks, 2 wounds, 6 courage. 3 might, 1 will, 1 fate. Comes with heavy armor and 2 elven made sword stock. His heroic actions are heroic strength. And his special rule is Whirl of Blades. If Orifin rolls 1 or more natural 6s when making a dual roll, then any dice that roll a natural six will make double the number of strikes they would normally when making uh, when rolling to wound. Note that strikes doubled in this way will not double again if the model orphan is fighting is trapped. Oh, so, I'm, I'm sorry, Rob. Were you still talking? I stopped listening when you said um, his heroic <laughs> action was heroic strength. I, yeah, right. I, you know I what? seriously heard that and I was like, I, 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 I was wondering that. why all of you suddenly looked like you went into a tunnel and, you know, and went and got some <laughs> coffee. Um, I feel obligated to read the words that were written uh, in the book, but, <laughs> but, but I don't have a lot to say about this besides 
I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's so, a really cool model. It's a, it's a cool narrative piece, but like, are you ever actually taking this competitively? Yeah, looking at this mathematically uh, and comparing uh, him to Tariel, who is exactly the same points, uh, I'm fairly sure except for this guy being defense six and Tariel being defense five, he is worse in literally every single way. Uh, Tariel is two extra fate, one extra will, actually has heroic strike, has an elven cloak. Um, the Whirl of Blade special rule is only ever really going to give you one extra strike to wounds, and it doesn't help you if you're trapped, whereas if Tariel charges two, two guys, she gets an extra attack. Um, and even compared to stuff like Rumil and Haldir, this guy is just like, no. Yeah. I would never take him in a competitive... Uh, the I only way was, this... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. It, I think it was always like, oh, should I take Rumil to get more troops but i was always hoping they'd have something better than rumo because even rumo's like mm -hmm, he's good but do you take him yeah i agree it's just the heroic strength if he had strike it'd be kind of cool yeah but just having strike. strike so would halder has strike and and rumo has defense rumo has defense which is useful Halder maybe has they and this guy has each brother got one gift i guess the brothers <laughs> wanted to be separately apart like i don't know what it, yeah. it yeah, march each, or something i don't know each, each brother got one gift and then they got to this guy and he's like i got a rock <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it, the, the only thing that makes sense i can think of mm. is that yeah they they needed they felt they needed to put a new figure out for Lothlorien because tactically it was going to be in the book and it was going to be in the scenarios. Um, but they didn't actually have enough slots to produce that figure. So they're mm -hmm. like, how can we write a figure that no one will ever buy? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Let, let's just make him have heroic strength. Yeah. And, and it solves their problem, right? They can add the well, figure for Lothlorien. Wow. Nobody's ever going to buy it. So nobody has to produce it. Um, and well, then they're good. Just to give them credit. Cause I'm sure GW, no, I know it's a joke, but I'm sure they obviously wanted you to play this thing at, at some point. I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to find the logic. I mean, three attacks. The, does Rumble have three attacks? Mm -hmm. No, Rumble has I, two. I think the three Haldir attacks two. because oh, yeah. people would people would still take Kelleborn because of the three attacks. Uh, so I think it was well, they did at fifty more points though. People will give it three attacks. So yeah, maybe yeah. this is a guy you're supposed to spam out with him and his brothers. So I think from a, a more like narrative focused army where you're doing something like that, you can do something cool or you have all three brothers leading a bunch of troops and they're fairly cheap. Um, I think anytime you see, anytime you see a model that has three attacks at fight six with an elven blade, you kind of have to, you know, at least pause and take a look at it, but he's a hero of fortitude. So it's really hard to ally him anywhere meaningful. Right. Um, and if you're already like looking at allies, you've got better options if it's in like Rivendell or something. I'm trying to imagine him in pure internally. Water. Like you, you don't really need what he does as much as you would need other things that other models do. So I, I just, I struggle to think where I would say, yes, this is the place where Orofin belongs. Right. Well, he, he's killy. Cause he does have that whirl of blade special rule. Well, right? if he rolls a natural six on three dice, then he doubles. So I if guess, yeah, well, they, but it only doubles the dice that rolled the six. So right. he's so only he's getting like four strikes usually, right? Right. He, well, no, he has a 50 and if he's already chance. trapping them, they don't do anything. Correct. Yeah, he, yeah, he has a roughly 50% chance of getting a fourth strike. So realistically, you'd only that rule only takes effect when there's the enemy model standing up. Like well, and I I it's kind of like Evan, like you said, uh compared to Tariel, like in this guy in a battle line, so he might super murder the guy in front of him, but any hero that's a fighty hero should do that. Whereas Tariel can like jump into six guys, get a whole bunch of attacks, and murder a whole bunch of people. Well, no one will ever surround Tariel. That's her threat. You can't yeah, like she has to take her on with infantry. She's not fighting. Whereas this guy, you assume he's in a battle line, so you assume he's fighting your standard like shield with a spear behind. And he's probably going to win, and he's probably going to get a whole lot of chances to kill that shield um, on a five, usually. And, and that's great, but, like, it, is that really adding to what you need as a Lothlorien player, right? Yeah, and I'm kind, of, I'm kind of, like, comparing him, actually. I don't know why, but who he reminds me of is Gorbag. Mm -hmm. Who you throw in, and he gets three attacks. Mm -hmm. and, but it's, like, Gorbag's 55 points and can strike and, and up. Can strike. It's kind of it like, can strike. Yeah, like <laughs> this guy's 85 points. Yeah. It's kind of so uh, I imagine a different approach. 
action other than strength might have helped him out. I mean, sure, it's strike. Think- yeah, but I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine it from the perspective of like I imagine what they did was because I'm seeing each brother has a different heroic action. My thought process they wanted them to be different, but it just well, it kind of makes so sense thematically. So Haldir shoots really well. Rumil is a defensive tank, so this guy is nominally the Killy brother, right? Like he's the attacky yeah. one. Yeah. So well, like thematically, it makes sense. Uh, well, look, look so if they wanted to go in that de- if they wanted to go in that direction, they could have made him the guy that marches. Or they, they could have put yeah. him on a horse. Well, that's what I was thinking, too, is like, if, if he, he had, had a horse, marched. this would be a different conversation, right? right? Exactly. And that's what they needed, too, because all the yeah. heroes are, they, they have a cav, cav section. So Rumo could have, like, led the fountain, fountain court guards, and he could have led the cav. Yeah. It would, it would be cool thematic. As and Haldir well, kind of so. leads, like, the wood elves or the archers. Yeah. yeah. I think if he had yeah. a horse, we would be talking completely differently about him. Because he'd be like be a Huron then, and like a Huron for Lothlorien would be really good. Mm-hmm. Even if he didn't have strike. Even if he didn't I have strike. The theme is to try to give Lothlorien no yeah. horses. I, well, I, three wait. attacks on a horse would have been amazing, right? For no, fight six yeah. better than Elf Blade. So. Yeah. And it's He'd Lothlorien, like so it would be a fleet foot horse, which means it would yeah. be utility in woods as well. So that would be phenomenal. That should have been what happened. You yeah. could even give him special rules, like two attacks, but when he's on foot, he takes his two blades out three it's a little baby thranduil you know what i mean yeah. we need a rule basically that says like for the next year jay has to take an army with this guy in it <laughs> and and he'll and he'll be fixed yeah there you go. <laughs> so look i i'm talking a lot of smack and i stand by it but i'm still gonna buy the model because the model looks amazing and i want to paint mm-hmm. it so like they're gonna get their money out of me but come on <laughs> but we're gonna use him as a captain because yeah captain i mean he's gonna sit it. on the shelf with <laughs> <laughs> it's a sense of completion at this point, right? Um, and because I have a problem apparently with this game, but um, but yeah, it's this is not an arm uh, a a piece that I plan to take out of the cupboard very often unless he's required for a narrative scenario that I have. Yeah, I, I think what this guy is going to be is he is going to turn into the dismount for my captain on horse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. very valid. So, and he does and come. Um, he model. does come in a pack with Rumil, a new updated sculpt for Rumil. So. Since Romil is impossible to get now, you're going to probably buy him anyway if you want Romil. So yeah. it's unfortunate, I suppose, just because out of Rohan at War, the Fall of the Necromancer, and th- this book, Defense of the North, it's like all three had a potential for Lothlorien, and we got one profile in there. Instead. Yeah. <laughs> so what it is, is we finally got the Easterlings like taken out of the basement and dusted off. And then they took Lothlorien and they put it down in the basement. (laughs) Um, And, and no Legion. It has to be said, I am shocked that there is no Legion. And I'm even more shocked because this would be the place to do the Legion where lady of light leads Lothlorien because she overthrows Dol Guldur. That's her whole thing. Right. Um, And not only is there not a legion for that, you can't even really do that in real life anymore since she became fortitude. So it's like a double sad. Oh, maybe we'll get Lothlorien at war. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Um, in any case, I don't think there's any more to say about Orofin. So shall we move on to the bad guys? I think we shall. So we are at the uh, we are at the Mordor section now, which we will go through before our grand finale with what is um you know probably one of the most exciting things to happen to evil in a long time uh evil (laughs) has two profiles and two legions in this book the two profiles um are rasgush and musger again we have covered them in um pretty pretty good detail on previous podcasts rasgush who i just called the batman because he is the guy who can um, bring uh, bat swarms and fell wargs and other things in his warband uh and gives all of his all of his orcs hatred elf and musger is the shaman the the kind of like not cardouche that has wither um so we we reviewed those pretty closely but they are they are both pretty good they've both seen a lot of competitive play since they've come out because they're solid so if you want to take a closer look at them or go back to our actual review of them please feel free to do so but they each get their own legion in this book which is very interesting and they're both actually pretty good legions so the first one is the legion that is um, built around musger and it is called the assault on lothlorien legion to add insult to injury there not only is there no lothlorien legion there's just one to beat up lothlorien Um, (laughs) but yeah so it is a mix of orcs goblins and griblies so it's a very interesting outlay of troops you've got um 
Musger, Orc Shamans, Druzog, Ashrak, uh, Moria Goblin Captains, Moria Goblin Shamans, sorry, I missed Orc Captains as well, obviously, Wild War Chieftains, Wild Wargs, Giant Spiders, uh, Orcs, Warg Riders, Orc Trackers, Moria Goblin Warriors, Moria Goblin Prowlers, Warg Marauders, and Bat Swarms. Um, so, and every everything in there has their usual options that they could take from the um, army list that they come from. Uh, you always have to have Musgirl to lead the Legion and at least one named Goblin hero, but based on the special rules, you're taking the Goblin named heroes anyway. Uh, you've got the same keyword lock for leading troops, so Orcs can lead Orcs and Goblins can lead Goblins. Spiders can only be included in warbands led by Druzag or Ashrak. And in this legendary Legion, Musgur, Druzag, and Ashrak are heroes of Valor, and Shamans are heroes of Fortitude. So you get a little bit of extra space to... Um, to beef out those war bands. Uh, the special rules are pretty cool. So the first one is called Cover of Darkness. And essentially every battle you fight against this army is gonna be night fight. You're always playing a night fight mission. So the Rudus visibility from, you can't shoot from 12 inches away, but you get a plus one to wound when you shoot. Uh, and models with Cave Dweller can ignore this entirely, which is most of this Legion, which is pretty cool. You've got Ruthless Savagery, which means that friendly orc and goblin models gain a bonus of plus one to wound in a fight in which the opposing model is outnumbered. Note that this is not like the animosity rules where it has to be one of each. It's just if you outnumber, you get plus one to wound. So just bringing numbers triggers this. Dark Magics, you can, um, friendly models may reroll any number of d6 when making a casting roll. So all of those wizards you're taking are becoming a lot more reliable. Exclamation and point, exclamation point. Exclamation point. Yep. And Venomback Spiders. If your force contains Ashrak, then all giant spiders in your force are upgraded to Venomback Spiders for free. So they go from rerolling ones to rerolling everything, right? That's the difference there, I believe, for Venombacks over regular. I believe so. They reroll everything except for ones, yeah. Yep. So so usually they reroll ones to wound for poison. The venom back gets them reroll everything. And it's usually, I think it costs, what, two to three points usually to upgrade, but they're free in this Legion. They're two points, yeah, usually to upgrade. Um, so that is that is a lot of stuff to cover. Um, this Legion is kind of awesome. Uh, this but, Legion's insane. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, like, so, like, so much insane. Insane. Like, The one thing yeah. that I will say about this Legion <laughs> that tickles me immensely is this is probably the first time in the history of the game that I want to max out goblin archers. Archers, yes, right? exactly. The first time ever. This um, is the le- this is the the legion that gives you a chance to use all of those goblin archers that have been sitting around in the bottom of your. No, everyone's been converting them to like swordsmen somehow. They've been taking the bow. Well, everyone <laughs> the jokes on them because they're good now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and look, I've got like forty of these dudes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, first yeah, off, that I, cover I mean, of darkness, awesome. I actually think that's pretty cool. The, so yeah. good. <laughs> every single game you play too is going to be so unique and fun. Yeah. And then it's just like even the the magic that they're going to shoot. Lothlorien has resistance to magic, and it's another salt in the wound. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, we can just keep casting like reroll things right. and stuff like that. Well, well, not just that. You know, but most of the magic in this list is stuff that gets cast on your own models. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it Drizag is re-rolling. auto auto pass. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is re you know, is basically re-rolling all of his, like turn that venom back spider into a, uh, you know, a, 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 a buzz saw. Mm-hmm. Um, and he goes through it. And, by, by the way, just so we can back up to why we're talking about why goblin archers um, are, are suddenly back in the game. Um, you know, for those who haven't kind of bumped into this, so the Goblin Archers are generally crap because they're shoot five and mm-hmm. they have a range of 18. So everything outranges them and out, out shoots them. Now, however, everything else is shooting 12 inches except the Goblin Archers who can see in the dark. So they are shooting 18. So they now outrange everything else. And when they hit, they still get the plus one to wound all the time regardless of the range yeah so you can't you can and i have done this out shoot elves with goblin archers yeah um, if you can guarantee night fight which you never could before right goblin archers were great but the problem is goblin archers came up in night fight once every 20 games exactly. and now it's always on it's amazing yep so uh yeah so this is 
this is a thing. So I love how like pleasure. the enemy marches into their lands and they're like, hold on, let's wait till darkness. Let's, right. <laughs> let's, go, let's calm down now. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like they've got a switch, like, or, it, right? You know, it's like, okay, so the elves are coming for us. Turn the lights out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. So <laughs> Sauron's cloud at all times. <laughs> yeah. Well, and let's also, so I've been playing around a little bit with this Legion in terms of like numbers and you're still getting like 50 models, even with a full complement of goblin archers, which are getting like 16 of them. You're still getting um, like four or five spiders, two warg marauders, two bat swarms, uh, a wild work chieftain, um, you know, that you can then enrage with Druzag. You're getting a uh, captain on warg. You're getting a bunch of shamans. Like it is, it is insane how cool and good this army is. It's, it's unbelievable to me. Not to mention the ruthless savagery. I mean, the anti-hero on that is absurd. Oh, yeah. Most heroes, so if you guys haven't played a rule similar to this before, most heroes are mounted. They're on 40 mil bases, which means outnumbering them is absurdly easy. Mm -hmm. And so basically, if you just simply have two models in that one, now you outnumber. And if I'm reading this correctly, even your spear sports, although they don't count toward outnumbering for counting toward that purpose, they still get the plus one to wound if you outnumber. So therefore, Correct. It seems yeah, so you yeah. could have two models on the 40 mil base, then you have two spear supports. All four of those models now gain plus one to wound against that one hero model. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, and, I'll, and I'll do you one better. Ashrak has <laughs> Shroud of Shadows, so he yes. can turn a spider into a ring bearer. <laughs> because of the faq run through his own guys into that combat make that hero a bad fighter and then nuke them right yeah <laughs> with plus one to wound all over the place yeah, yeah. Like, and re-rolling all wounds for venom and being enraged by yeah, because like, it's now a venom back i mean and that's if that hero it made insane. it intact through 16 plus one to wound bows yeah and so, shoot into combat too with plus one wound like yeah that's, and yeah. that yeah i mean there's it's unbelievable. Like, this is, in my opinion, now, now keep in mind, I've, I've never actually tested this, but this on paper is like one of the most powerful legions I've seen. Yeah, right? on paper, this is insane. So, yeah, I mean, so the problem with the list, right, is it doesn't have any real killy heroes, but what it's going to depend on is it's going to depend on those spells. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's got the White Warg Chieftain, so... You know, Plus one to wound up. whenever you need it, and, well, like, that, I mean, that's the thing. and combat, right? So... So if you cast Channel Shroud of Shroud of Shadows on the White War Chieftain and infuriate it on the same turn, which you can do. You can't actually, because Ashra can only cast it on spiders. Yeah. Spiders oh, and bats. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Got it. But, you, so but you can, your you idea can, is still. No, you, you can enrage the Chieftain. You just can't Shroud of Shadows it. Right. Okay. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, okay. So you Shroud of Shadows. Saddles a spider, mm -hmm. you enrage the chieftain, then you Correct. put the man on the same figure and it's dead. And you trap it with your one random orc out of the 50 you have running around. Well, all, all you, you need to do is outnumber it, right? You don't need to trap. Oh, you, that's right. You don't need to trap. You just need to outnumber You just have to oh outnumber God, right. so Like, fun. literally, that's what I was saying about the 40 mil base. If a hero runs that's in so and you bad. have two on one, which is very normal against a 40 mil model, you have plus one to wound across all your models in the fight. Yeah. Well, not and to you mention do not fact, need to trap. Yeah. Well, not to mention the fact that if you are going to shroud of shadows somebody, you're going to trap it because you will run through the line and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not to mention you have bat swarms for the event that you, for some reason. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, if you were really worried about it, suddenly you have bat swarms yeah. too, right? I mean, yeah. very, oh, by the way, few bat swarms. <laughs> very few heroes are safe in this army, against yep. this army. Right. I mean, that this army's pretty... Well, and if for some reason you're not killing the heroes, you're reliably withering them with Musgur because you're rerolling your casting dice. So you're making them worthless anyway, right? Like, it's which, just insane. By the way, if you happen to be playing a Moria Prowler army, which I know many people out there like to do, they all get plus one to wound again with their throwing knots. Oh my God, they do. Yeah, they do. So, you're right. <laughs> so it's like every single thing, like you said, Devin, every single thing gets plus one to wound. Yes. Well, and they're, they're getting... If you get plus one to wound out out your army. If you're outnumbering, you can kill yourself Prowlers too, get like, plus three to wound in combat, right? Because Blackstabber plus the Legion plus two-hander. Hey, well, no, no, you don't get Backstabber. Well, you certainly don't get Blackstabber. We're not, we're not even going. Backstabber. No, no. <laughs> Backstabber. I don't think, 
Oh, no, no, that's right. It's a Prowler wound. Yeah, Prowlers yeah. have uh, Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah right. that's right. So Prowlers are getting plus three to wound. So if for some reason your bat traps that model and you throw in a Prowler, it's just going to, like, chop it in half. Yeah, plus two to wound. Like. This is nuts. I mean, the that's army. Be even and then, like, it's just the idea of every army being a night or every game being night battle. Like you get to go to a six game tournament and turn off the lights every single game. Mm-hmm. And that's going to, I think, mess with people when it comes to competitive meta. Cause you don't know, especially you guys did the e- ETC review too. Maybe a person from each group will just take this mm-hmm. and just run with it. You, you know, just to- in my opinion, this army is going to be all over the place. Mm-hmm. I yeah. the fact that this army can turn the tables on. I mean, every single army we've discussed is well, not every single one, but like most armies we discuss is talking about getting the range advantage, and this one just flips everyone's ideas immediately off. And, I, I mean, anything we've been you asking for, you know, mm-hmm. we've, been, we've been asking, we're not asking for, but we've been wanting things not just profile wise, but scenario wise change you know, mm-hmm. battlefield wide, like change to where it like brings this new diversity to the game. And mm-hmm. I think that's amazing for it. This yeah. is like now one of my new favorite legions. Oh, I'm so excited yeah. about this one. I don't usually play evil armies, but I look at this and I'm like, goblin archers, sign me up, right? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's not much else to say about it other than the fact that it's making mm-hmm. all the, the bad stuff in Moria that you never bothered to take actually good and usable. And I think Absolutely. that's awesome. Yeah. And we, and we still haven't talked about, what is it? Um, Musger gives the entire army. Is it? No. Oh, no, no, no. That's the, the other guy, Razgush. Or yeah, Razgush. Um, yeah, Musger, yeah, yeah. Musger specifically. This is, this is an entirely game. different story. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's so, move uh, on to let, that. Yeah, let, let's move yeah. on to that one. So yeah. let's, let's now go to, um, it, and it's hard to follow that legion with any legion, but particularly hard for big boy Razgush. So the next legion is the Fell Beings of Mirkwood. So whereas that one was the Assault on Lothorian, this is the army that went to um, take out the elves of Mirkwood and uh, kill Franduil. So this one is... Um, led by Razgush, the war leader of the north. Uh, you can take orc captains, shamans, taskmasters, and drummers. You can take the spider queen. That's always interesting. Um, and then orc warriors, war riders, orc trackers, murkwood spiders, giant spiders, fell wargs, and bat swarms. Um, why is my computer frozen? What's going on with my computer here? Sorry, my computer froze a little. And so I have to reopen the book. Okay, so um, the fell beings of Mirkwood must always include Razgush, the war leader, who is your army's leader. That's not a surprise. And then it has uh, three special rules. So through the forest, friendly infantry models gain the woodland creature special rule. Death to the elves, friendly models gain the hatred elf special rule. And the war leader, Razgush gains a bonus of plus one to his fight value when engaged with an enemy elf model. Um, so it's I love it's, I love this both both both, both fine, legions right yeah it, here's the thing I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with this legion I think that when you put it up next to the Musger legion it looks a little bit less amazing and I think that part of the problem is that so much of what this legion does you can kind of already just do by taking Razgush right because a lot of these these rules yeah. are tied to him as a profile so the only really new thing you're getting here is woodland creature for your entire army which is admittedly great and the ability to um, take the spider queen innately without allying and it doesn't say anything about um, war bands having to be pure or anything so she can lead anything in this army uh, anything yeah, can she can lead orcs and stuff yeah um so whenever you've got a uh, spider queen and bat swarms available in a list you have to take it a little seriously but it's it's you know it's not as exciting as the Musgrove one. It's but it's solid. So, Evan, you seem to have thoughts. I want to I want to hear from you. Yeah, as someone <laughs> who has very 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 often used Mortar with the Spider Queen, um, I would never in a trillion years mm-hmm. ever consider using this list. Um, I think Mortar with the Spider Queen just outclasses it entirely in every single way. Um, and just just to go over the special rules individually, um, because that's sort of where the uniqueness, so to speak, of this legion lies, um, because you can get all of these models by allying in uh, Mordor and dar- the Dark Denizens of Mirkwood. Um, Razgush's plus one bonus is nice, but it's really not going to get you that much. 
Um, and I've, as I've noticed with that sort of type of alliance, um, Razgush isn't the, the best hero in general because he, he's strength four and doesn't get plus one to wound and doesn't get the knockdown. So it's really hard for him to kill stuff. Um, Hatred Elf is almost completely useless, I'd say, um, because all of your orcs already have it. And generally, I'd say your spiders and creepy crawly things don't need it because they're already wounding stuff very easily. So it's a nice bonus, but it's really not going to get you that much. And Woodland Creature is all right, again, but um, especially seeing as your spiders and uh, your bats, your bats can fly over the terrain, your spiders can crawl through it. That's not going to help you a lot. So in my mind, um, this Legion barely gives anything special rules wise. And uh, in contrast, it entirely restricts the models that you are able to take uh, in this sort of alliance. And while sure, you can mix your war bands up, I'm not entirely sure of the merit of that particular arrangement, seeing as if you ally in the Spider Queen to Mordor, you can take all your beasts in the Spider Queen's warband, they make a nice mobile unit, and then you can make some ni a nice shield wall in the mortar list and then combine them together. And I think, unfortunately, that will just create a better list in basically all circumstances. So I think they had an interesting idea making this list with the sort of elf, so sort of as a counter to uh, Army of uh, Gothmog, where they've got the man special rule, they've got the all the elf special rules mm -hmm. in this one, but I just don't think they went far enough into that niche, and I think they ended up creating a product that um, is not competitively optimal. Mm -hmm. But do you like it or not, Evan? Uh, yeah, I love it. It's my favorite <laughs> legion. Um, it's just so incredible what they've done here. So I, I think that one thing, um, like you said, the hatred elf is nice, but you just get that anyway for taking Razgush. So it feels less, um, it just feels less special. And, you know, him, him getting plus one to his fight value. So he's going to six. And the fact that he's paired with bat swarms makes him a little more reliable against elf heroes. And that's cool, but it's not like game breaking. I think that this Legion will become a lot more interesting if they ever do do something like make the spider queen hero fortitude and you can't just put her into Mordor easily. Right. Or ever. Um, if they do that, then this becomes a lot more interesting because it does something that you can't otherwise do better and with better heroes. But as of right now, I agree that this is more of a like a fun, casual game night kind of list that you that was going to look great, right? And it's a great theme to it, but it's probably not going to light up the tournament scene. And and I just want to clarify, just because I can see people screaming at us on the screen here or <laughs> Spotify, uh, we are acknowledging the fact that yes, spiders and giant spiders don't normally get the hatred toward elf. Um, as the profile reads, it's actually only orcs and or captains but i don't think any of us rate that highly enough for it to take the legion and negate getting felbies or anything else that you have access to well the, um razgush has been showing up a lot in competitive lists with a bat swarm but he's paired with like the witch king and all of the other good stuff yeah. right so well that's that what i mean like right, removing yeah. the witch king option yeah, exactly is not worth giving hatred elf to mirkwood spiders <laughs> I, it, I like this legion thematically i think it's cool and i i will certainly play it and try it out um it would not be something i default to if i'm looking to go to an event where i want to do really well yeah. it would definitely be more of a kind of a passion project uh, a lot of scope for great conversion work um like mixing up kind of the aesthetic of the spiders and the orcs and uh, a lot of pieces i like individually right um so i don't i don't hate it it's just from a competitive standpoint, it's it's okay, right? So just to ask a quick question of like, we're starting to see a rise of um, armies that are sort of anti very specific armies. So like Dunlending's via Rohan or this with Els and Gothmark men. I mean, how do we feel about the fact that you might wind up against an army randomly that suddenly counters you? Well, I can't say this counters you completely. Well, that's what I was thinking. I like it, it to be honest. 
if your buddy is the guy that like plays elves all the time and loves playing elves mm-hmm. and he's the guy that you play with like every week this is the list for you i mean isn't that kind <laughs> of tim's situation in life right now yeah right? exactly uh, so yeah. like tim until um uh, until such a time as that's not the case is gonna love this legion right i mean at a tournament does it feel like i mean i'm sure an elf army could easily think, beat this but i think from a tournament standpoint i don't think it's too much because it's not really super competitive you know what i mean yeah. it has like a little it's gonna like counter elves and stuff like that but it's not breaking the game even dunlin for example like it goes up against rohan and that's great but still it's not an auto win against rohan yeah and i feel like the same with this though it is funny i find it funny that you have two new legions that totally counter elves when the elves defended all of the north and like rivendell right, yeah. and, wood. <laughs> and it's like to thank you we're going to build these two legions to counter you yeah. and then also like i remember our discussion of like fight five and stuff and tim's not here but he brought up a point that like oh like what about elves they're losing their supremacy and again, I, I play evil men, so I'm like, the time of the elves has passed. <laughs> Let's destroy them. Like it's okay. So my 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 opinion's biased, but I think it's fine because I don't I don't think it breaks the game. I think it makes it more interesting. Well, I, I don't mean to say it breaks the game. Just simply coming as an elven player coming across an army like this, not to say it's an auto loss, but does it feel annoying to know you're playing an army? Well, I, I feel as an elf player though, like you look at this and you're like, I'm going to win most of these fights anyway. So your hatred is meaningless, right? As, exactly. as an elf exactly. player, I would be super happy. I'd shoot this army to dust. <laughs> like If I brought Legolas, I pew, 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 <laughs> kill the spider queen and then run and then in just with my defense six. And, go. <laughs> and yeah, sure. He's got hatred. He wounds me on fives. I wound him on fives. I outfight him. Um, I can still beat Razgoosh. If you've got Galadrim Court, you can still uh, reliably beat both Razgoosh and the Spider Queen in combat. And other than those two models, there aren't really any hero threats. Mm -hmm. So I think despite the fact that they've added in these special rules that sort of counter elves, I don't think this army is going to be particularly effective against elves. Yeah, and I think um, to your point about the other armies, um, like Army of Gothmog and Dunland, I feel like they have a gimmick against someone, but they don't rely on that to play the game necessarily. Like you can play against anyone with Dunland and do pretty well. And if you happen to play Rohan, it's a cherry on top. Whereas this Legion doesn't do anything but try to screw over elves and doesn't do it particularly effectively anyway. So I don't think it's going to trouble elves much um, at all. Well, if you if you want an addition, I, I I guess this this list is the additional penalty if you're going to take, uh, you know, instead of taking Haldir or Rumil, you take their buddy Orville or whatever the hell yeah, his name Orville. is. Orville, <laughs> Orville, Orville, the uh, the elf. And <laughs> Orville would take the turn now. Yeah, this is Haldir Nor- and Rumil and Orville. The heroic strength <laughs> was meant for this army here. That's what it was necessary. Right. Yeah, be. exactly. Yeah. Now, I, one, one cool thing that you can do with this army in Mordor that you can't do on anywhere else is they all get woodland creature with a drummer, so they're fairly fast through woods. That's unique, at least, right? Makes them Isengard-ish and um, Isengard scout-ish. Mm. Um, so to give to give a shout out to some of the things the Legion does that are unique to the Legion, at least, that's, that's neat, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so... Um, any other thoughts on the fell beings of Mirkwood, or should we should we take off the muzzle in the leash and let Rainier finally have his moment in the sun and move on to the Easterlings? <laughs> Wait, there's a Corsair yeah, Legion. going to start spazzing like on the screen. <laughs> I, do, do you need to take a, a moment and uh, and go get a glass of water? Because here we go, the <laughs> Easterlings. We have finally come to them. Um, so uh, there are five profiles for the Easterlings and one Legion, and every single one of them more or less is great. Um, three of those profiles are, are those that we have already covered before because they have already previously come out with their rules. That's the, the Dragon Cult Acolytes, which are the two wound, uh, or the two attack ninjas with throwing weapons, and then Rutabi and Brorgir, who we all agreed are phenomenal uh, and have immediately seen tons of competitive play. So um so we don't have to go over those again but rutabi is the is the master of battle like phalanx commander and brogir is the the super war priest for for reference um so you can look at our 
our in-depth review of those in a previous episode. Um, we've also kind of quasi reviewed the Dragon Emperor, but this is the first time we have the actual full rules in front of us. So we're going to do it again. Plus, I think we all want to talk about them again. So let's save that for last, though, and quickly go over the, the other new profile, which is the, the unexpected Easterling or, or Runish Wardrake, um, which is something that nobody, I think, saw coming uh, out of anywhere but well you it, you never see them until it's too late that's really well that's kind, kind of, of their thing, thing apparently yeah. right the the runish inquisition so um the runish war drake it is a drake infantry warrior keyword it's got it's a 20 point model uh move six fight four strength four defense five two attacks two wounds and courage four it has armor teeth and claws as its equipment because it is a dragon um and its special rules are terror and venom um it also has the rule slow acting venom, which is on top of the venom special rule, which is a reroll all wounds, which is that any model that suffers a wound from a runish war drake but is not slain reduces their fight value and attacks by one to a minimum of one for the remainder of the game. Um, once an enemy, mo enemy model has been affected by the special rule, it cannot be affected again for the remainder of the game, even if wounded by a different drake. So one bite from a drake makes you one fight and attack less for the remainder of the game. Um, so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you if you save the wound with fate, that doesn't happen. As I yes, read the rules. yes, okay. it yeah. is because you didn't suffer a wound. A wound. Yeah, right. yeah, so, you didn't suffer it. Right. So you have to actually be be um, be wounded by it for it to take place. Right. Uh, I actually think that this is a really interesting profile. However, it's hard to judge it because we don't know what it looks like. This one doesn't actually have a picture, and the model has not been released yet. So depending on whether this is on an infantry base, a cavalry base, or a, like a troll base will yeah. change how yeah. I feel about. That's okay. actually what I was going to say. Like I well, don't know if this is on a 25 mil. Yeah. I think well, the, yeah. the two things to take into consideration, one is the speculation on the base size and, and two is, is movement six worth it? Because mm -hmm. we, when we think of a ruined Drake, we're thinking, oh, like 20 points ruined Drake, it's going to look something like a fast moving spider but maybe not like it has a move six. Like what's that going to well, look like? Well, more it's importantly, it base. does, it does not benefit from the drum. Correct. It does not have the Easterling keyword. Right. So this is going to be slower than the rest of the army on, on the approach, which is a problem. And you know, one of the things that kind of goes into the 40 V 60, it, if this thing's 40, this is going to kind of be a real problem because it's basically, it, it's, it, it, this is half troll capability mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's going to be on a significantly larger base. You also will not be able to back it up with pikes, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. which is, I think, going to, you know, you really we really want this thing to be on a twenty five millimeter base for this thing to be usable, so you can back it up yeah. with pikes. Although you can only back it up with one pike because it does not have the phalanx mm -hmm. special rule. It yeah. does not. Which arguably with two attacks you wouldn't. Yeah, need. you don't need right. right. I, I mean, it's it's like the whoever those uh or the the dragon called acolyte mm -hmm. guys yeah. um but uh it it i think it, it will be extremely useful for it to be backed up by one pike mm -hmm. Go, going on the whole 25 mil thing though i can i'm trying to envision if it is uh would i want to do a whole line because people do this with half trolls where they're like mm -hmm. do a whole line of half trolls and then like mahood spearman in the back I, would I don't. To do the same thing? I don't think so. I think the role for these guys, assuming they are twenty-five millimeter bases, is to protect the flanks of the phalanx because mm. they have terror. Mm -hmm. So you know the the scary thing for the phalanx is always like flying monster or something that can hurl jumps on the flank of the phalanx and then hurl somebody down the entire length of the phalanx. Mm -hmm. And if you have like one of these guys or two of these guys hanging out on the flank of the phalanx causing terror um you have to think twice about like committing your 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 monster even if he has a small chance of failing a a, a terror check um to actually you know getting there because you know he could blow it and then you've kind of lost it for the game so that's and, and you know and even if he doesn't blow it um you know he he jumps in there and this guy's fight four if he's within six inches of the dragon emperor is where going to talk about in a moment he's going to be fight five he's going to get two attacks and he's going to get a banner and he's going to get a pike um so you know even if you get a guy in there you may you know you pass the terror test you may not win so i think that's the role for these guys is you only take a couple of them and they're the guys that kind of cover the flank of the phalanx from those monsters yeah i think i think to the 
strength four is like the only thing that the Easterlings have, the only model that the Easterlings have that strength four, because mm -hmm. I was expecting something more killy with this supplement, but they've gone the route of just adding more dice to fights and like stuff like that. Well, yeah, he's, I think he's strength four with venom, so he's rerolling. Mm. Really I, yeah, ones, and, that, and though, I think right? that's good for the Easterlings because it uh, will just one. No, I thought I thought venom is all of them. Or am I? Because I know poisoned weapons is ones. Poison then, weapons uh, is one. Venom is reroll all failed wounds. Yeah, so he's actually pretty. It's pretty killy. Killy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, also, and then his okay. slow acting venom. I think with that special rule against heroes that what is it? The slow acting venom makes the fight go down, right? One fight go down reduces the fight. Of fight the fight and attacks. And, uh, attacks, yeah. So I think for like a lot of those mid tier, expensive eighty to hundred points heroes that are fight five, if you get one cheeky wound off of them, um, and they only have one fate, like Orphane that we just talked about, Curan, I'm thinking, or other people like that, they're kind of screwed because then they're going to tie the Easterlings or lose to the Easterling fights when you have fight five, and they'll yeah. just be killed. All right. We're talking I guess, heroes. I wonder monsters. Yeah, monsters. Yeah, I think monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, which is another reason why you have to think twice about kind of jumping into the flanks with these guys. I guess the reason I'm not that excited about this rule is a whole bunch of things need to happen before it comes into play. I mean, first, you've only got a six inch move. So you actually have to get this thing into contact with a multi wound hero or, or a monster, or whatever. Then you have to wound, or I'm sorry, then you have to win. Um, then you have to wound, then it has to not fade it, assuming it's not mm -hmm. arguably it has no fade. winning the wound with a strength four to attack, reroll all should be fairly easy. Not yeah, easy. unless you're against defense seven. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not like it's never going to happen, right? But mm -hmm. like I, all I'm saying is there's a lot of things that have to happen um, before yes. that comes into play. It's ironically almost better against like half trolls and bayornings, right? Where they they can't fade yeah. it. So, yeah. well, yeah, but then you're you're reducing the fight and attacks of a yeah, single little model. I mean, yeah. I really see it as being monsters. I mean, I feel like heroes are definitely going to fate these things mm -hmm. and then try to kill them. Yeah. It, I guess That's it's nice that it redirects the attacks from the heroes onto these things versus maybe Rudabai whom you'd throw in there with them or something. Well, yeah. and you're right that bringing a troll, like a mortar troll down to fight six and all your heroes are fight six um, suddenly makes that a lot better, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I yeah, mean, it, all, all the consideration for 20 points, it's kind of like, ooh, like 20 points is so cheap. You might as well take one or two. Yeah. But yeah. But it's, yeah, the and, and, uh, it's the base, right? So like if, if it's on a 40 mil, you might take one or two. If it's on a 25 mil, you might take... A couple more than that. If it's on a sixty mil, I don't think you take it. I think at that point, yeah, it's terrible. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. So, it, it's not going to be on a sixty mil, yeah. and nobody would take it if it's on a. 60 I think mil. I think it can be pretty safe to assume that this is unfortunately going to be on a forty mil because I don't know about you guys, but I'm fairly sure off the top of my head, I can't think of a single bestial model that is on a twenty five mil base. Like even well, I was the great like babies. Like the broodlings are on a 40 mil base. No. Yeah, broodlings are on a 40. 40 yeah, they are. They are. So, yes. The Drake itself, you know, those babies. That yeah, the baby out. Drakes. That was the only hope I had was maybe these are like I think those Drake, are too like small. Babies. I, I have to I agree these, with Evan. Based off the lure, what they're writing, they're 40. kind of like the domesticated Drakes mm. for the Easterlings. And also, like it, a dog. it doesn't the make sense have armor. either to be able to pike support them. Like, how would that make any sense? Just like a line of these guys. Oh, we're not saying it would make any pipes. sense at all. <laughs> we would just do it. Right? It would be possible. Yeah. <laughs> well, so like, it doesn't I, make sense, but we'll still do it. <laughs> I, I think if it was a 25 millimeter base, what you see is this little lizard type thing that was like on a chain. Mm -hmm. you now and like it's like the dog on a leash right it's literally like yeah. maggots dogs oh by the right? way maggots dogs yeah exactly yeah. Maggots yeah, yeah, dogs yeah, yeah. are a 25 millimeter base beast but you know it would be Which... kind of like the the snaky dog on a leash that you're gonna like unleash on the enemy and the guys with the pikes are the guys that kind of like herd it along behind and then stab mm -hmm. the enemy when he's at their throat so i, I, I think it's uh with, with that, size with that Rottweilers? yeah with that said i wouldn't be shocked if this thing was on a 40 millimeter base that's I think probably if, on a, if this is on a 40 yeah. millimeter base i'm not sure i'm i would take these things 
Yeah, I, I think it would be really cool if they were a little like 25 mil base Mushus, but they're almost certainly probably going to be cavalry bases. So, and I'm sure they're going to look amazing. So again, I'll probably pick a few up and um, I'll definitely experiment with sprinkling a few in, but, um, but that's going to hold it back. The, the big base is definitely going to hold it back if, it, if that's what pans out. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, that is the Runish Wardrake. I'm happy to have it, even if it, you know, uh, even if it's like the least exciting Easterling thing that we got, it's still awesome to get this much Easterling stuff. So let's yeah, get to the big man. Oh, real, 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 real yeah, quick, yeah, go the for it, of it. It has armor. So I know we always joked around about like Matt's dog popping up with an Easterling helmet. I think this will literally be Matt's dog with an Easterling helmet. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, good. There we so, go. That would be amazing. Then, it, then we'd all have to take it. Well, <laughs> even yeah. if we weren't playing Easterlings. I was actually imagining one of those like dog fur coats that people put on their little fluffy dog. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best. Well, yeah, yeah, just, uh, <laughs> I have one of those for when Gandalf needs to go in the snow. It's pretty goofy. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you imagine like when uh, like Rutabi shows up at the airport with her 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 Drake like on a leash you know, <laughs> in this armored vest going, yeah, this is my service animal. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is my service Drake. <laughs> it's, it's hard to see in this helmet, so this is my C I Drake. Uh, sir, sir, if your service Drake devours another passenger, we're gonna have to force you to leave the aircraft. <laughs> he didn't devour him, he just made him fight less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, well, we've come to it at last. Um, the Dragon Emperor, the big man, um, the, the head honcho of the entire faction. Uh, again, we have done like two kind of quasi reviews of this profile just based on inferring things from um, preview articles, but we now have the full official rules to talk about. So going through them real quick, um, and there is a lot of them, fair warning, yeah. uh, because of the palanquin. But uh, I'll do it as, as quick as I can. So the, the base profile for the Emperor himself, uh, fight six, strength four, D7, three attacks, three wounds, courage six, and three might, three will, three fate. Awesome. Um, heroic actions, resolve, strike, strength, and defense. So a strength and defense in there, which is great to see. Uh, he comes with heavy armor, the Emperor's glaive, and the helm of the Dragon Emperor. And then the Royal Palanquin is his base war gear. The Emperor's gra Grave, the Emperor's Glaive is an elven made spear that may use the faint special rule. So like I Glos. Additionally, the bearer may use the shielding special rule, even though they do not have a shield. Uh, the Dragon of Emperor, the Dragon Emperor of Room may not support whilst mounted on his Royal Palanquin. So uh, great. He can shield or he's got a spear that, um, that can faint. Helm of the Dragon Emperor gives them resistance to magic. Um, and then he has phalanx, which is actually really great, um, as a, so that you can put him in the line and he's got emperor of the Easterlings, which is the rule that gives them a battlefield wide stand fast that also affects Easterling heroes. So that's, that's the base profile of the emperor himself. And then we get to his, get to his ride, the palanquin, the palanquin, um, is essentially just six black dragons standing on top of each other's shoulders so strength three defense six six wounds attacks is star because it really depends on how many of them are left living and courage four um and then there's the the wall of text that accompanies the palanquin so the royal palanquin is carried by six black dragons each one with a shield and sword they do not take up any spaces in the emperor in the dragon emperor's warband we already knew that was going to be the case this is a mount for the dragon emperor of rune however it does not act like a normal cavalry uh, and therefore will not confer the cavalry keyword to the Dragon Emperor. Instead, it will be treated as if it were an infantry model. Whilst the Royal Palanquin has three or more wounds remaining, it moves as normal. If it is reduced to two wounds, it, its move value is reduced to three inches. If it has only a single wound remaining, then it cannot move at all. Sorry, Boris the Buff Easterling, you cannot carry it on your <laughs> own shoulders. Um, when the Palanquin is hit by a shooting attack, uh, the shooter must make an in the way test to determine who's hit. It's one to four is the palanquin. Um, five plus is the dragon emperor himself. Uh, if the dragon emperor dismounts from the royal palanquin for any reason or is slain whilst riding the palanquin, replace the palanquin with the number of black dragons equal to the remaining number of wounds it has. Uh, they do not need to take a courage test to see if they flee. And these models, along with the Dragon Emperor, should be placed within the footprint of the Palanquin, which we don't know what that footprint is exactly yet. Um, that looks that looks 60 mil. Uh, it looks big. Yeah. Um, so they'll it's all fit in big. there. 
Yeah. Um, unlike other mounts, the Dragon Emperor does not use any of the characteristics of the Palanquin. Instead, he uses his own char- a set of characteristics, even if one of the Palanquins is better. Um, I think that's literally just the wound stat, actually. Uh, if the Dragon Emperor wins a dual roll, except when shielding, then in addition to his own strikes, the Palanquin may make a number of additional strikes equal to its remaining wounds. These strikes are always resolved after those of the Dragon Emperor and cannot make special strikes. And this is the money rule right here. The Royal Pan- Palanquin cannot be knocked prone for any reason, with the exception of it being directly hit by a siege engine. Um, uh, God, it's just so many, so many words. Uh, the, <laughs> the Royal Palanquin and any model riding it cannot be affected by the hurl or barrage or barge brutal power attacks. Additionally, the Royal Palanquin will not be moved by the Sorceress Blast or Colwyn's magical power, though it will stuff, suffer any of the other effects if applicable. Whew. So that's the rules of the Palanquin ding, 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 base. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. By the way, then... <laughs> that was that was the rule that, or that was the thing in this book that like really widened my eyes. Yes. Um, Because I figured the counter to this thing, well, that and that and the price of this thing at 170 points. Because I had yes, thought it's 170 was, points. Forgot to mention 170 that. points. Yeah. Um, Which is actually kind of a bargain in many ways. A bargain? <laughs> Are you kidding? Oh, so you, cheap. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I had thought that the counter to this thing was going to be like barges and hurls and sorceress blasts, blasts mm-hmm. to knock him off and stuff like that. But no, but no. <laughs> um, so yeah, so he's pretty well immune to everything except for, ironically, the wind lance, which will have a lot of fun knocking him <laughs> off his balance. So, yeah. so I think we just made the argument for always taking it for that time to <laughs> knock the palanquin right. off. Um, And then it's got two special rules. We've already kind of known about these, but here's the official wording on them. The first is standards of the emperor. The Royal Palanquin is a banner with a range of 12 inches. Amazing. Um, As these banners are attached to the Palanquin itself, the dragon emperor and the black dragons do not suffer minus one um, penalty for carrying a banner. Awesome. And in the name of the dragon emperor, friendly Easterling warrior models within six inches of the Royal Palanquin and who can draw a line of sight to it, gain a bonus of plus one to their fight value. So... Whoa, that is a mouthful, but man, is it a mouthful. There is a lot to chew on here. So Yeah, context-wise, Amder, uh, 15 more, 15, what is that? 145, 25 more points. You get this guy over Amder. Yeah. I think my biggest, like, oh, like, is he going to be worth it was his points. 170 points, Lord have mercy for all he, all he does. <laughs> Lord like, have yes, mercy please. indeed. Yeah, and Lord he, have mercy. Like it's he, it's too much. No, not too much. I so love his, it. It's too much in a good way. So and his, even the his, synergy. I'm thinking his worldwide uh, or his battlefield wide stand fast. You don't have to hold him back because of Rutabi. You're yeah. most likely gonna win uh, priority and let him go first. Call it, and then everyone gets to pass their test. You know what I mean? Like just yeah. the synergy that it's gonna give is just amazing. He, he is going to be in like every Easterling army. Yeah, yeah, there is. There's, I mean, he, there is, there's, he is now the first model that you take in every, I, I mean, yeah. it's like Kamul and Amdur, you're never going to see again. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, I, I thought I was going to be sad about it because I love Amdur. Amdur's my favorite model. I love playing him, but now but, I'm like, oh, buddy. Yeah. I, so like, just no, to, it's okay. There's a new one. There's a new one. <laughs> just to tick off, kind of the benefits here because not only is he 170 points but he gets a banner which you know he gets a 12 inch banner which which counts as a banner for mission which counts as a banner for mission objectives so you don't have to take that 25 point banner so you just save that in your army list we're going to get when rob talks about the legion to the fact that everybody in this guy's warband of which you can get 18 gets black dragon status for free so that's another 36 free points so now if you're keeping track you, you you've got a bargain of 61 basically you do not have to spend 61 points not to so, mention he brings six black dragons with him 24 yeah. black dragons all six of them for free and the six that he gets for free do not count towards the break point yeah. either mm-hmm. and just to that's give you like a, it's... just to give you a sense of comparison here his his palaquin is essentially Boromir's Banner of the White Tower with double the banner range. Yeah. And Boromir's Knight of the White Tower banner costs 50 points. Yeah. This is better than that. Mm-hmm. 
So not only does he bring 61 points of basically free stuff with him when he shows up, you get this, you get this 50 point, oh, well, pl- more than 50 point banner. Let's just call it 50 points, mm-hmm. even though it's got twice the banner effect. Um, and that shows up too. So that's 111 points worth of stuff that you're getting with this model. So all of the other stuff you get, you know, the actual profile <laughs> um, <laughs> it ends up costing, uh, let's do the math here, 59 points. <laughs> yeah. And that's I mean, a profile. Just I, I heard, he's going to be your leader. I, I heard some fake. conversations on uh, Facebook, people saying, oh, he's not going to be as good as you think because he's on this massive base. So he's, it's going to be hard for him to get into combat. It's going to be hard for him to fight. You don't need this guy to fight. No, you that's don't, you don't need him to do anything. He's not going to fight that's people. What Evan's saying. He's just, just going to sit around next to his it. army, for give this them these on. massive buffs, save their points. And then if he kills a couple of guys, that's cool. He's added a little bit of extra value in there. I mean, it's just... You'd expect him at least to be Boromir, Captain of the White Tower, points level. So like 200, so 210 So salty about that. So salty. But and and nope. by the way, there is no risk to putting this guy in the front rank, or not the front rank. He, he goes in the middle of the phalanx, right? And there's a yeah. wing of the phalanx on one side. There's a wing of the phalanx on the other side. Yeah. Um, and it, if they don't, it, the army you're fighting does not have a compel in it. Um, there's no, there's really no downside to this. Cause if they throw in, you know, even if they've got like a ring bearer and like some other evil heavy that they send in against this guy, he just calls a heroic defense. And it's like, all right, I'll deal with this the next time. It would probably, well, which probably that, doesn't, that doesn't affect this talent. Yeah, so like on top of that. he, he could actually lose his mount. That's, oh, that's, that's the only well, reason you'd be yeah, concerned. Yeah. I suppose that's true. Um, it depends how many attacks you can build out. If you surround him, you, you'll kill his mount pretty quick with a hero and a couple of strength four models like if you actually trap him and right. just deal it all on the mount then you this can is a, this is a model you need to be very conservative with while playing because a lot of his value does come from that palanquin and uh if he loses it uh he's not a bad fighter but he's not particularly exceptional He's not yeah. worth 170 points once you no no, no you're right yeah, that, that's a fair yeah. point but the I mean the palanquin takes a lot of pounding um before it goes down with a six hit and not well, just that I, he has three fate, three fate too like he's not gonna you'll be lucky if you wound him he but can't like fade his mount him. he can't fade his mount yeah he's not a he, he doesn't have um royal no horse lord he yeah. didn't have that so that would be that. very funny though if he like yelled down to his people carrying the palanquin like hey step away from that sword <laughs> <laughs> it would be kind yeah. of more like hey walk it off right <laughs> yeah it, it, it's also going to be difficult if you put him into the phalanx and wedge him because i think also rutabi goes right next to this guy and by the way Borgir goes right behind this guy mm-hmm. um right. so which we got to talk about that combo by the way yeah yeah um <laughs> so that you know, he, he, and he's going to have a phalangite on the other side of him. So the only, the only, you know, you're going to be able to get one guy into him. And then that's, I mean, unless, unless you have some way to like get around behind him. And I think you can kind of like throw a couple of cav guys in behind him to protect his rear. Cause remember he does have the phalanx special rule. So he can back up two guys if he needs to. Um, the, uh, it's going to be really tough if you put him in that place to get two heroes in on this guy. Um, and one hero, even if he loses a fight, isn't going to be enough to take the, uh, it's going to be enough to take the Palaquin down in one go. I don't think so. But I, I think you said it correctly from the get-go you float this guy behind the line and he doesn't have to do any fighting he just he doesn't have out to buffs. and then yep. if you depending on how the game is going and depending on uh what the vp situation that you need is like if you really need to towards the late game he just steps off his palanquin and then just like brings six black dragons and starts bullying people if he needs to right uh and all you needed to do is keep him alive for most of the game until you got a distinct advantage and then he just steps off to like hammer the game in or throw his black dragons back on objective or something when it's already over um so like the amount of utility he has even if he is not in the front fighting stuff is incredible is incredible um the other thing that's i mean because remember he's also going to be coming with a 
coming with the drum. And, you know, one of the mm-hmm. typical Easterling tactics is, you know, there, there's an, there's an approach march phase where you're basically going to be like marching from, you know, nine or 10 inches right up into the guy's face. Mm-hmm. And you can use that nine inch drum movement basically to kind of shift everything around. So the phalanx goes mm-hmm. or Rutabi goes into the face of the enemy's big hero and then this guy just kind of goes into the face where he's just going to go forward and hit the line and kind of mow through it with his extra six attacks <laughs> and um, or his extra six strikes. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to be a perfectly viable tactic mm-hmm. for this guy is just yeah. use that extra three inches of move on the approach march mm-hmm. from the drum to shift everything around so that the guy's, you know, hero killing ability is somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, oh. it, it expands the pike walk too because his base size is like the size of what three or four pike pike or three or four models yeah so it's kind of like if you have four four in him that's still just like a 12 line pike block it's it's just insane yeah and, and mm-hmm. you know if you stick rutabi near this guy too i mean anybody that goes near this guy or into this guy is going to be calling heroics all over the place that rutabi is going to be like "Ooh, let me try that one yeah, <laughs> <right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds fun yeah, yeah. i will well, say if you manage to win a combat against this guy uh with a hero like aragorn or whatnot or any monster i mean if you just target like i know he has three fate but if you just target the dragon emperor nothing stops you like the the one to four five up it doesn't work like the Condi's chariots from what i'm understanding like you can just directly start hammering away at the uh the emperor uh, you can I, yeah i'm pretty sure yeah, it that only it affects doesn't shooting, it only affects shooting yeah but so he's, you, he's you defense could just target him he's defense seven three wounds three fate i'm not yeah, saying exactly. he'll put down quickly but he's defense six with, only defense six. with is he defense six no, defense six or defense seven right? uh he's defense i think it's defense seven right he's defense he's seven. seven the, okay. the seven. palanquin so is uh, it, seven. He, he's easy to trap on such a large base mm-hmm. and so if you could get the right models on him because keep in mind to win the fight he only has fight six with three attacks he can't use his palanquin to win the fight so if you can win the fight trapping him shouldn't be too difficult uh given the circumstances and so i'm thinking if you target everything at him, you might get lucky enough to just knock out the entire palpin. I think he might be more fragile than we'd like to let on. Like I don't know. We'll see. I mean, so mm-hmm. remember, he's always going to be surrounded by the phalanx. So, yeah. well, you know, that's the thing is I would keep him surrounded by the phalanx. The earlier example you gave with the compel, even with resistant magic, I would actually keep him pretty protect, protected with models that'll stop him from moving out because I, I think he could be killed well, what, a lot faster. If you're going to be using him to fight, you what you don't want to do is you don't want to put like one guy in front because then you have the problem of, you know, like, you know, the one guy, somebody charges the one guy in front and then either is doing a heroic combat or a barge or, or something like that to get at him. And that's a problem. I think you... I think you want to. I think you want to generally have this guy fight, um, but I think you want to have him fight next to Rutabi on one side and a, and a phalanx on the other side. Mm. And it's an enormous. It's. I think it's going to be an enormous investment of resources to try and bring this guy down. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be really hard to do because I think in reality, you're going to get either two dismounted models into the front of this thing, or you're going to get one mounted and like one dismounted model into the front of this thing because two mounted models if he's kind of walled in if on either side are going to run into zones of control of the guys on either side Mm -hmm. um and uh and stop him and i think this guy can take just about any threat unless there's like a ring bearer wearing the ring as one of the guys that's that's fronting him Mm -hmm. so remember if you if you kill the guy he dumps six black dragons down (laughs) and you have to deal with them now Mm -hmm. like i i can see a legitimate tactic in scenarios without banner points where at the end of the game or near the middle of the game he goes on an objective and just dismounts and yeah, suddenly exactly. there's seven models on know. that objective yeah if you want to get rid of your 12 inch banner and plus one i mean fight on, bubble, on I'll, the I'll final turn I'm, I'm not yeah. saying i'm not saying you you do it like 
you know, immediately. But if there's a final turn and you're in contention for an objective, or if it's hold ground, then on well, the and last if, turn, if the army you're fighting is fight three, so you don't care about the plus one fight, right? Well, two, we, yeah. yeah. We we should also talk about I, what I think is the single largest limitation that comes with this figure. That is, he may be the only figure I'm aware of who, when you when you when you buy the host of the Dragon Emperor, which comes with basically the six black dragon dismounts mm-hmm. that come with this thing. He actually costs more than his point value. He does. He... At, at two hundred dollars, <laughs> he is. That is, you know, mm-hmm. you're 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 paying more than a dollar a point. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> somehow, rate, still feels undervalued. Like my <laughs> wallet feels undervalued by paying yeah. for it. Right? I, I'm not sure there's another another one like this, but we, we may want to go on and, and talk about the Legion. Because... Yeah. So uh, we'll uh, we'll go on and finish this off strong with the host of the Dragon Emperor Legion, and um, you know everything that's been said about the Dragon Emperor um, will continue to be said because this guy's going to be everywhere. So we'll have plenty of time to talk about him. Um, the Legion is awesome. <laughs> it's really good. So it's basically, you can take everything in the Easterling army, uh, save uh, Amdur and Kamul, which makes sense because they were they were down at the Pelennor. So it's the Dragon Emperor, Rutabi, Brogir, Dragon Knights, Captains, War Priests, Warriors, Cataphracts, Dragon Cold Acolytes, and Runish War Drakes. Um, surprise, surprise, the host of the Dragon Emperor force must include the Dragon Emperor of Rune, who will be your army's leader. And it has... Um, so it has three special rules. One of them is essentially just the Easterling army bonus where they get plus one courage when their force is broken. So it's great that that carries over into the Legion, but we've all um, we've all been playing that for the while. Um, also, the you get to re- dice, re-roll the dice if the scenario would end and you don't want it to. Um, but these are the two incredible rules. So the first one, the Dragon Cults. Easterling warriors and Easterling cataphracts in war bands led by the Dragon Emperor or Easterling Dragon Light Knights do not need to pay the points to be upgraded to Black Dragons. This upgrade is free. That is phenomenal. So that's Which thirty-six is, free points when you just take the phenomenal. And I mean and that that brings your Black Dragon pikemen down to nine points, which is uh, really really strong. Um, and then this is also a really good rule that is only kind of let down by the fact that you don't have enough heroes to use it on, but heroes of the Easterlings, Easterling hero models may re-roll a D6 in a dual roll. So all of your guys, your heroes, not only do they get the 12 inch banner re-roll, they also then innately re-roll another D6. So your fight six, three attack heroes are all re-rolling two dice in a fight just for showing up. Yeah, I don't so think that, that's good if you want to like spam Dragon Knights for some reason. Well, I, I mean... But was, even like Rutabi and the Dragon Emperor make great use of that, right? Well, yeah, yeah exactly. The, 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 the Dragon Emperor, you know, basically is like Lord of the West now too. So mm-hmm. he's, you know, and he comes with his own banner. So he's rolling three dice and re-rolling two of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and Rutabi is within twelve inches of him for sure, so she's also re-rolling two of her three dice. Right. Yeah, I think the Legion. I'd, I'd argue like... in this list actually, though, I think Dragon Knights do definitely have a place. Agreed. Um, especially with the ability, they charge in. They've got their four dice on the charge. They re-roll two of them, um, and you get. 12 free extra points of uh, black dragon warriors that you get for free. I think an 800 point army of dragon emperor, Rutabi, Broer gear, and a dragon knight on horse with just a bunch of guys uh, could have some real merit in both hero hitting power um, and just uh, the, the sheer volume of uh, fight five and fight four models you'll be able to get. Yeah, I couldn't I, agree more. Couldn't agree more. Because Easterling, the... Easterling oh. Cataphracts for 14 points suck because of fight three. Mm-hmm. Fight four Easterling Cataphracts for 14 points are worth it. Yeah. Fight five Easterling mm-hmm. Cataphracts when they're within six inches of the Dragon Emperor on his Palaquin for 14 points are phenomenal. And, and that's like a huge like uh, negate two fell beasts. Now you can just have a cataphract yeah that's right. the back. it used to be and or you pay 145 points for it right yeah you exactly. can have a 14 point fight five just throw them in they're like hey what's up like or, or, even... or one of those uh one of those war drakes like you know mm-hmm. on the flank you know well, i guess and... you could argue the um the dragon knights are getting the horses for free almost when they get all the upgrades for free the um 
the the, the cataphracts and the the, the mm-hmm. yeah they get bargaining. 12 points of free upgrade so yeah, yeah almost, only three so points like three on the point horse. Well, and with the cataphracts, because you're getting the black dragon upgrade for free, you would even consider paying the point to give them an axe. And now you've got to fight five 15 point cavalrymen, right? With um, all of the rules that they have. And then they could also go up to strength four if you needed them to. So um, it's just, yeah, do everything, do all the things in this legion. Um, um, and I, I'd, I'd argue, though, uh, there are even less reasons now for a runish war drake because they just have no synergy at all with the mm-hmm. rest of the lists. Mm-hmm. Um, they they don't get the plus one fight value from the uh, from the emperor. They oh, uh, wait a minute. They oh, because they don't have the, they don't have the Eastern yeah they're not Eastern awesome. yeah they don't. Oh, yeah, I take they back a bunch. Don't, of they don't get the drum, yeah. um, and they just. Do they get compared the compared to I don't the even think they get the banner, the cataphracts, right? Yeah, yeah they, no, they do get the banner. The banner is just a banner, yeah. so everybody gets the banner. But yep. compared to the value of the cataphracts and the normal warriors, I just think, like maybe if you're trying to be have a have a variety, you throw one in just because. But I think really mm-hmm. zero is the way to go, especially in this legion. Yeah, and I, I really like um, I really like Brorger in there too. We didn't really talk about him, but since the palanquin can never be knocked over, if it's in trouble, just tremor and like everyone falls but you. Oh right? uh, yeah, uh, wow, that's cool. I didn't even think about that. Actually. And then if Rutabi is yeah. in that combat, she gets all her rerolls because the well, model's now trapped. Correct me if I'm wrong, but tremor when you you cast it on another model and then the the shooting goes away from you, right? It doesn't, uh, does it knock down the people in the combat with you? No, it knocks down everyone in the combat. Yeah, because it, it goes on a straight line, and anyone touched yeah. by it gets knocked down. And if it's well, a wait combat, a it knocks down. The no, whole no, no. But but the but the rules stated. Read it again, Rob. Did it state other special the magical rules, powers man. similar to Sorcerer's Blast and all that? Um, for the Emperor specifically? Yeah, the Palanquin. Because yeah. like, let me I'm let me double check. Curious. Because it has to say specifically the wording cannot be knocked to the ground by magical powers such as, you know, uh, Sorcerer's Blast, Call Winds, and other. The Royal Palanquin cannot be knocked prone for any reason with the exception of it being hit directly by Siege Engine. So any reason at all. Okay, so it just covers it all. Un- unless it literally is hit by a siege engine, it cannot be knocked prone for any reason. So and yeah, Tremor magic. is a neat little tool to use anytime the and now obviously the opponent has to go first but that's pretty interesting and if you can somehow orchestrate it where the uh the emperor is attacking like let's say boromir and you know a, a warrior of gondor mm-hmm. then just tremor the warrior of gondor and you just created a new problem <laughs> That's not bad. So I'm not I'm not entirely sure how that works with Tremor because I know with Sorceress Blast you can't resist it. The question is is Tremor the same way? You're only targeting could Boromir resist. So Boromir can only resist if he's hit by the line. So that line that's caused by Tremor, that D6 line, it has to touch Boromir. If it doesn't, which of course is easy to orchestrate, Mm -hmm. then Boromir can't resist it. Oh, that's interesting. An interesting wrinkle. Yeah, so like, uh, so whether it's Rutabi getting rerolls or the Emperor just knocking down whoever he's fighting, like Brogir is is, and then if Brogir isn't knocking him down, he's blade wrathing or enchanted blazing a million attack palanquin. It's just insane in this legion, and it all feels kind of like you can do it because all the Black Dragon discounts means that you have way more points than you otherwise should have, right? Yeah, Brogir is actually pretty nasty with this thing mm-hmm. like it, in combo like it just just now as a defensive measure that you can use that's actually pretty cool so it which is kind of funny because if Borgir is far enough away from Rutabi you can benefit from calling a free heroic action attack things and if someone counters and you know surrounds then Borgir hasn't moved yet because he's mm-hmm. out of the bubble so if you play it correctly yeah, I mean, it'll take some um, like skilled play and good positioning, but it's a very doable trick, right? It's a nice get out of jail free card for I misparked my palanquin in the wrong parking lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I mean, suffice to say, uh, Easterlings, quite the glow up, very, very different army after this book than it was before this book. Um, 
Anybody else have any specific thoughts on the Easterlings? Well, did we mention that the Legion does not have Amdur and does not have Kamul in it? Oh, we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, we okay. did. Yeah. Right, uh, which, which I think we kind of expected if it was going to be a, a North-based Legion that they wouldn't be there because they're right, very yeah, specifically Pelennor figures. It's not a surprise, but it's worth pointing out. Yeah. I guess just curious, um, Rainier, with your usual Easterling mix, I mean, is this really taking Amdur out of your, like, for example, your Kandish Easterling combos that you do? or For me, my Kandish Easterling combos give a kill punch, which this le- this Legion does not, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And I, I think, like, we're raving about it. It's great. You're getting discounted points. You're going to finally be able to hoard out Easterlings and have the, the movement phase that we rave about. But for me, if I would make any critique to it, which I think it should have a weakness, it's killing power. Mm-hmm. They, 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 they gave it more fight. They give it more dice to the fight, which is like, okay, you already have so many die. But yeah, the killing power, even for me, if I was going to play this really super competitively, I think I would still possibly go Kondish Easterling for that punch and the killing power mm-hmm. because you still get the speed with Kondish Easterlings. Are but you still bringing that, the Dragon Emperor over Omder in your killing power list? I would, uh, I think I'd take, I'd take the Dragon Emperor over Omder. I'd have to reconfigure now that I know his points, mm-hmm. which I'm probably going to do after this podcast ends. <laughs> but I would consider that because Amder, you really wanted him as that extra danger to like kill things. If you, I brought this guy instead of Amder for Eastern <clears throat> Kondish list, I could throw away my Kondish Kings without worrying about them losing hero points, you know what I mean? Or leader points. And I could still have that back of Amder like fighting against fell beast or monsters because he still gives fight five to like things all around him. So yeah, I'd have to reconfigure it, but Omder is going to probably go on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think in allied lists, Omder still has a place at large, but I think you're going to see him a heck of a lot less than you used to. So, yeah. Yeah. But it's still, it's still, again, like to the strengths of the Easterlings, we talked about it. They have the movement phase. Now they have a ton more die. They have fight six heroes. They have Rutabi, who I think we're talking about the Dragon Emperor. Rutabi is in that mix. Another mm-hmm. lower cost, not lower costed, but underpriced in a sense for what mm-hmm. she gets. Coupled with the Emperor, I think this Legion is going to be very dangerous. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't say it's going to be like the Isengard Legion where they're going to have to tweak it because it starts winning absolutely everything. Mm-hmm. I actually so think you see Rutabi outside that. of Easter Lanes. So, what is that? I just I think you see Rutabi outside of Easterlings, maybe even like Hopefully you know sure. allied into like War or or something. I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I think you're going to see the Dragon Emperor allied into stuff outside. Oh yeah, to confer fight five into like other armies. This is the first time Evil has access to fight five, uh, except for half trolls. But you know, well, and monsters. But you get what I'm saying for an infantry base, right? Yeah, you know. I mean, so yeah, Dragon Emperor and a bunch of Black Dragon um, pikemen, and then you know you you put uh, Moran and Orcs in front of them. Yeah, this yeah. this guy gives Suladan competition for that role because yeah. he sort of fills the same niche with the massive banner and the supporting capabilities. Obviously, Suladan uh, hits a bit harder um, and is cheaper. But this guy is a much better supporter. He brings along those fight five pikes, um, and uh, he's it's just more much better. Too. In so to get role. that, remember to ally it in. You're you're paying for now him plus the black dragons, which are eleven points, I believe. Get eleven it out with a pike. pike, yeah. So you're you're paying a hefty price overall with that combined arms force. You're paying a hefty price to get that fight five. Um, a lot more than like good would play with to get elves, but you also get a twelve-inch banner. Mm-hmm. And that is very true. And you also <laughs> and you you also get six free more models if the dismounts yeah. right. So, yeah. No, I, I think um, I I think that overall, probably if there was one model that was the most impactful out of the Easterling list to come out, it would be Rutabi. I think that like point for point, she transformed everything, but like, it's pretty toss up because the dragon emperor is also obviously incredible um, for his points for what he does. So uh, yeah, like huge, 
huge glow up for the Easterlings. And I look forward to seeing them on every table for a little while as yeah. people have all of their pent up Easterling passion vented out over the next like two months. Right. And I guess after a while of playing these we'll probably do another army list review for the Easterlings and, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, you know, go over our thoughts after having played this for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. After having played like a dozen games of Easterlings on Easterlings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, no, think, I don't know what I you're think, talking uh, about. I'm going to do these legions. What was it that that um, I forgot the legion already? The oh, the uh, yeah, the Bell creatures or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the um, or attack on the Florian. Yeah, 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 there you uh, go. yeah. the the yeah. foul beast legions. Yeah, um, yeah, that's actually going to be an interesting face off. Is the foul beast legion against the Easterlings? I mean, I want to see how the you know Dragon Emperor fares against all that plus one wound. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, that's that's what heroic defense is for. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess then you just try and break down the palaquin. Actually, it's one final thought. Her defense is affected palaquin. It doesn't. That's that we no. were talking about that earlier. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. No, that would not affect the mount. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, lots I of good stuff. Um, are gonna, I, th- I think, sorry. I think they they can counter horde armies and elite horde armies because they have the defense to close the gap and the mm-hmm. speed to close the gap yeah. without losing a quarter of their force. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. then when they clash with other like, big horde armies like goblins they're going to cut through it like butter or goblin town they're going to cut through it like butter and then you have elven blades on your heroes so i feel like those like semi horde elite armies this one's going to fare really well against those yeah. because of movement and defense and then of course the elven blades mm-hmm. yep well, and the fact that Easterlings have the drum, which is not very common, it just continues to be such a huge piece of the puzzle for them. So, um, yeah, anyway, so uh, any kind of like overall closing thoughts? Um, I have to say for me, I think that uh, on the whole, this book is an absolute knockout. I think it's done a lot for the meta. I think it's done a lot for just bringing new life into a lot of different factions that either didn't exist or needed it. Um, the models have all been phenomenal for it. I love that we have another entire frontier of Middle Earth to explore in terms of models and even like narrative scenarios. So I give this book, you know, a solid nine out of 10 with one just big Orville sized hole, bringing it from a 10 out of 10. But other than that, um, hugely satisfying for me and can't wait to get this on the table. So any closing thoughts from you guys? Yeah, I'd give it a 10 out of 10. But that's because uh, I'm in. Hope so <laughs> I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it an eight point five out of ten, and minus one for Orville, and uh, minus, minus oh, a ha- minus a half for the Windlands. They would have been better off leaving Orphan out of the book and just saying we forgot them again. Ten. They um, could have, and you're for right. Similar reasons. We remembered they, you. We just didn't care. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, we would have been better off if they'd said, "Oh yeah, there's gonna be a little, little Florian book later," even if they had no intention of ever writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that at this point, uh, that's it's unfortunate because it almost makes me like fat smack in the face. But I mean, for me, yeah, the book is is pretty solid. I mean, I'll definitely say the same remark is like, ah, I wish they had left the elf out. But yeah, but um, overall, I think every other profile that they wrote, I'm trying to think, maybe the war, well, we don't know if the, the the base size of the war trick, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, every other profile is fantastic. All righty. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this uh, slightly longer episode. We had a lot of ground to cover. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, please make sure to comment and give us your thoughts on the various profiles and legions and how you plan to enjoy this book. And um, always great to come together with the guys and talk some Middle Earth and we will see you next time. So bye-bye Orville.